I'm Elizabeth Ray. I'm Alistair Stevens. And Tom Cruise is Pete Maverick Mitchell in Top Gun Maverick. It is January of 1990, and you are one of the three and a half million Americans who just bought a brand new copy of Playboy for the cover price of five American dollars. Bruce Williamson reviews the new releases of the month, including Steel Magnolias and The Fabulous Baker Boys and Kenneth Branagh's Henry V. Mike Royko writes an article entitled The Drug War's Over, Guess Who Won? There are advertisements for Southern Comfort and Wild Turkey and Newport Cigarettes and Maxwell Cassettes. The cover story is a profile of Joan Severance, who had just broken on the big screen and was about to become a featured player in the erotic thriller genre of the 90s. There's a retrospective on an art series by Andy Warhol. There's a fashion spread on what 90s men are wearing in the tropics. There's a short piece in which Andrew Dice Clay offers the fascinating opinion that women cannot be funny, and there's a surprisingly in-depth preview of the 1990 college basketball season. There's a poll to choose the playmate of the year. The winner, spoilers, will be Renee Tennyson, the first woman of color to win such an august award. There's also an interview with Tom Cruise, then 27 years old. In a conversation oriented around the release of Born on the 4th of July the previous month, legendary left-wing journalist Robert Shear challenges Cruz on his responsibilities as an actor, responsibilities which Cruz seems to be taking very seriously. He says, quote, I don't want people thinking of this as just another Vietnam movie. It's a film that tells us we can't just blindly trust the leaders of this country, that we ourselves must search and find out where we stand and what we believe in. It's not easy finding the truth about anything. Shear replies to this, quote, It's also the flip side of Top Gun, which is essentially war by Nintendo game and a peon to blind patriotism. Cruz responds, quote, Okay, some people felt that Top Gun was a right-wing film to promote the Navy, and a lot of kids loved it. But I want the kids to know that that's not the way war is. That Top Gun was just an amusement park ride, a fun film with a PG-13 rating that was not supposed to be reality. I don't want to go on to make Top Gun 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. That would have been irresponsible. So anyway, welcome to Top Gun 2 with Top Gun 3 in rumored (laughs) pre-production now. I bring this up to frame this whole discussion and to emphasize that as we discussed in our episode on Top Gun, for all of its rah-rah machismo and militarism, Top Gun as a movie is careful not to pursue a political agenda, except... You know, in the broadest sense, we will note, of course, being good, responsible global citizens that we are, that apoliticism is a luxury afforded the enfranchised, right? Mm. It comes from a position of privilege itself. But Cruz has been ducking allegations of rampant patriotism since the release of the original film. And I'm not defending the politics of that film, but trying to distill out instead what the film really is, as opposed to what it seems to be from a distance, because it's not about patriotism. It's not even really about Americanism. It's kind of a comfortably middle-class, mid-century masculinity. That's really what we're focused on. We're definitely focused on the boys' own melodrama of, of heroism and big feelings and loyalty and family. It is much more a superhero movie or a sports movie than it is a war movie. But what it's really about, what it's really about, is crass commercialism. Top Gun was an incredibly popular movie, and this does not have a political heart. It has a commercial heart. It exists to be a movie and to make money. And in that way, Mm -hmm. it's just like all the other Lega sequels that we have seen over the years. Elizabeth, two questions. How do you feel about Lega sequels? And how do you feel about the term Lega sequels? (laughs) I think the term is cool. The term is cool. Right. Uh, In general, I do not like Lega sequels, and I am not interested in them. And I think that they're almost always worse. Uh, and I don't, I mean, usually any sequel is a little bit worse, but usually these ones are a lot worse. I was going to say, as we've noted in our discussions of Mission Impossible, you are kind of down on the sequel as a phenomenon, right? In general, yes. I would rather just see something new or, you know, oh, it's basically the same thing again, but, you know, we filed off all the serial numbers and somebody else is doing it. Like, I would rather see that than just kingdom of the crystal skull or whatever like we're, we're just getting too far down the road i think uh with, with most of these sequels that being said i think that top gun maverick is awesome yes. <laughs> really no, like we'll, we'll break that conversation <laughs> i do want to delve in a little bit because as a filmmaker how do you feel about 
the tendency in Hollywood over the last 20 years, like this is not a new phenomenon. It is a mm-hmm. phenomenon that is kind of bootstrapped by Joseph Kaczynski himself when he makes Tron Legacy back in the mid 2000s. How do you feel about this phenomenon of raiding the cupboards for intellectual property, for finding any proper noun that has been previously trademarked and turning that into a new movie, a new version of itself? I hate it. I think it's yeah. stupid and I think it's lazy and I think it's an easy money grab. And I think that it's something that has long been pointing us towards AI generated content where you don't have to do any fucking work at all. The absolute race to the bottom. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I, yeah, I don't like anything about it. Yeah. That's the thing about AI, of course, which is a thing that we're going to return to talk about next week as we discuss Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, of course. But AI is only going to generate an undifferentiated gray goo of content that is never going to, like, it can do that. People who think that AI can't write a film or write a novel are about to be proved wrong. Yeah. But it's never going to generate anything of real significant value. Yeah. And if there's no artistic value, then intellectual property value, like actual objective commercial value, is all that remains. Yes. Do you feel optimistic that we're going to move past this? Do you feel optimistic that we're going to just run the coffers dry, that we're going to use every bit of intellectual property that we've already got, and then we'll be forced to come up with new ideas? Or do you think we're just trapped in an endless recycling loop now? Uh, I am not optimistic that this kind of shit will end. I am optimistic that many people will tire of it, and so there will be more people that will start making movies again that are, you know mid-budget movies but still have like real actors i say real actors like great talent and i think you can say real actors for reasons which will become clear within the next hour of this podcast yeah yeah yeah. um i i think there's a greater appetite for that already uh and people are already expressing like i don't want to see another five billion dollar picture with eight superheroes in it like i'm ready to see two people fall in love in the fall you know for what it's worth though all these things are of course cyclical hollywood was decrying the phenomenon of remaking earlier films in the 1940s and then in the 1960s and into the 1970s we've been down this road before and it's always led to the last time it really happened in hollywood it led to new american cinema exactly it it led to a, a whole swath of films that are produced on a low budget with with a new kind of grit and a new kind of perspective and new stories to tell so maybe we're just a few years away from that i really think we are keep our fingers Mm -hmm. crossed it does take a long time for top gun maverick to finally emerge as a full-fledged legacy full-fledged legacy sequel in 2010 Despite what Cruz had to say in 1990, in 2010, Paramount approached Tony Scott and asked him to develop a sequel idea with Jerry Bruckheimer. At the same time, Christopher McQuarrie, after working with Tom Cruise only on Valkyrie, this is still very early in his career, is independently asked to take a swing at a script. Scott decides that he wants to tell a story about the end of the dogfighting era, the end of the human Mm -hmm. element in the cockpit, contrasted with drone warfare. Cruise and Val Kilmer are interested in reprising their roles, but the plan stalls out in August of 20. 2012, when Tony Scott unfortunately takes his own life. It's not until June of 2017, then, that Joseph Kaczynski visits Cruz on the set of Mission Impossible Fallout and shows him a lookbook and a poster mock-up for Maverick. Cruz agrees to do the movie and announces the movie and the title during the promotional tour for The Mummy. We'll get into the production story on the other side of the. Yeah, have something to look forward right? to, I guess. I honestly think that that's what it is. Smart man, because he's when announcing it comes to this it. business, he gets it. Yeah, he's announcing it before there's a cast, before yeah. there's even a story, yeah. let alone a script. He is just bringing in this high-profile thing. He's bringing in the one thing he can say that will absolutely get everyone excited. The yeah. one thing that people actually have been asking for since 1986. Mm-hmm. As I say, we'll get into the production story proper on the other side of the trailer game. But I do want to talk a little bit about. The timeline here, because this does mark an interesting interruption in Cruz's career. Cruz makes 44 films as of this date, 44 films between July of 1981 and July of 2023. That, math fans, is a career of 42 years, which means that he averages a little more than one movie per year. In fact, it's an average of 356.6 days. There are some unusually short gaps, particularly early in his career. In 86, Top Gun is released 28 days after Legend, which is dizzying to think about. That is wild. What a great year. (laughs) Right? In 1983, All the Right Moves is released 77 days after Risky Business. And also in 1983, because 1983 is famously Tom Cruise's four-movie year that really establishes his celebrity, The Outsiders hits theaters two weeks before the release of Losing It. Two Tom Cruise movies released within the same month. Yeah. One of which is pretty good, and the other 
is currently pegging the bottom of our list. Exactly it's so. It's right yep. there. The gap between Mission Impossible Fallout and Top Gun Maverick is therefore the longest period of time without a Tom Cruise movie since his career started. Mm. 1,395 days from July Damn. of 2018 to May of 2022. The other longest gaps are 945 days between Jerry Maguire and Eyes Wide Shut, because that's what will happen when you spend two years making Eyes Wide Shut with Stanley Mm -hmm. Kubrick in London. The other long gap is 910 days between All the Right Moves at the end of 83 and Legend. Prior to this gap, the last year that didn't have at least one Tom Cruise movie in it is 2009, which is the gap between Valkyrie and Night and Day. Between 2009 and 2018, it's at least one movie a year. So for all that his star has fallen, particularly during the early part of that period, he is still turning out the work. Mm -hmm. Let's get into the trailer game, and then we're going to talk about the production of this, frankly, insane movie. Insane, yeah. It's not that you were younger. It's not that life was easier and the world was smaller and we were unencumbered by a constant barrage of the most provocative and exploitative news information that can be dredged up by people seeking to make a buck off of your attention. It's not that there was a middle class and a decent cost of living and far fewer billionaires. No, things were different. Candy tasted sweeter. Coke was made with real sugar and movies, movies from the 80s were just better. Tom Cruise used to be Tom Cruise. Jennifer Connelly was Jennifer Connelly. And Glenn Powell hadn't even been born yet. Top Gun Maverick. (laughs) Pepperidge Farm remembers. (laughs) Apparently Budweiser remembers. Jesus Christ. Budweiser all over this movie. It's really quite embarrassing. Real question. Yeah. When was the last time prior to Top Gun Maverick that you saw a Budweiser commercial or any kind of Budweiser product placement or advertisement of any kind? Uh, I work in a bar and that bar (laughs) plays football games. So for me, (laughs) results are skewed. But but I hear what you're saying. It's football, right? It's just the NFL and Super Bowl spots. Basically, yes. That's Mm -hmm. it. It's just was up and those frogs and like (laughs) that's it. I forgot about that, but yeah. Uh It doesn't feel like a product that needs to be advertised anymore yeah <laughs> and yet i gotta tell you but that's it's part been... of it it's like oh no it's just america this is just american beer that's it's what american the beer default is. american yeah. beer. you're so completely yeah, right it's absolutely. been got at least 15 years since mm-hmm. i've had a budweiser and, and hopefully it'll say, be 15 years before i have another right and <laughs> i'm i'm a miller girl because i'm a wisconsin girl so budweiser is out of st louis and miller is out of milwaukee so that's where i tend to go for my Cheap domestic American beer. I am a Miller High Life girl. Two houses, each alike in dignity. Mm, what's your cheap American <laughs> domestic beer? Uh, I don't need to terrible. say American and domestic, I guess. But anyway. I do, well, because not everyone is domestic uh, in America. Our, For our, our international yes. audience you and your you're international right. co-host, See? my cheap domestic beer of choice, it is the most basic choice, but it also speaks to your Wisconsin roots, of course. When PBR is very cold, when Pabst Blue Ribbon is very, ah. very cold, and importantly, you are by an open body of water and yes. it is 95 degrees and you don't care what you put in your body. Uh-huh. That's that's the time for PBR. That's, that's when PBR shines. Yeah, I but see I am that. not a domestic beer. No, kind of neither guy. of us really are. No. Yeah, and even those two are like kind of on the outskirts of the like domestic beers. Like usually, if somebody's got a handful of them, it's like you get Budweiser, you get Miller, you it's get true. Miller Light, Bud Light, and you get Mick Ultra. Like those are the ones that are everywhere. And in that instance, I'll probably go Miller Light. I don't know that I've ever had a Miller Lite. That's okay. There's no reason to. When I'm drinking beer like that, I go to like a a Dos Equis. I'll take a, you know, which is a different kind of thing. (laughs) Super not domestic, but I hear what you're saying. No, no, no. That is like where I go rather than. Sure. If you're grabbing a beer out of someone's ice chest outside, like, yeah, I get it. What is your favorite beer right now? Just for those paying attention at home. My favorite beer, period, right now. We are famously on record as drinking uh, Coop F5s from here in Oklahoma when we reviewed Twisters. Yes, which is actually not my favorite, even of a Coop product. But uh, I guess recently I'm really digging those. They're grapefruit IPA. You've been into a lot The grapefruit IPA is yummy. I'm enjoying that. Uh, And I'm enjoying the... The Voodoo Ranger the Voodoo Imperial Ranger, IPAs. Which, which kind of looks like a Top Gun tie-in product. I will drop the, the Voodoo <laughs> Ranger into the show notes of this. And yeah, you can see I the, love uh, that beer. The advertising for that. 
let's get into our story then, because okay. I just really want to talk about this film let's go, with you. Yeah. Kaczynski is hired in 2017, and he pitches two ideas to Tom Cruise. The first version of the movie is oriented around Goose's son, who is now a naval aviator, just like his dad. The second is oriented around The Dark Star, an experimental program shrouded in secrecy. That is a much more thriller oriented kind of conspiratorially minded kind of story and of course is now relegated to just the prologue of Top Gun Maverick right. as it's released they're building off of drafts created for Scott and for Bruckheimer by Peter Craig who had scripted the Ben Affleck movie The Town and would then later go on to write uh, The Hunger Games Mockingjay 1 and 2 mm. he wrote Bad Boys for Life he wrote the Matt Reeves Robert Pattinson The Batman he's a very well respected huh. screenwriter and had written an early script for Tony Scott Justin Marks also wrote an early draft he he was known at the time for writing the script for the live action Jungle Book remake, yes. the John Favreau sure. one, which talking about things we don't need I and, and I didn't ransacking watch, but... the, the treasure chest of, <laughs> of IP there. But he's better known now for show running the very popular TV series Shogun for FX. Oh, yes. I just saw it swap the Emmys. Yes. Yeah. After Kaczynski is hired, Eric Warren Singer, co-writer of American Hustle and well-respected script fixer, was brought in to mm. completely overhaul the existing drafts and to build something new. And of course, Christopher McQuarrie is brought in the following year, along with Aaron Kruger, a screenwriter best known for his work in the Transformers franchise, but yeah. who is also writing Kaczynski's forthcoming racing movie, F1. <gasps> oh, yeah. Did you know? Things I'm excited about. Did you know that Lewis Hamilton is a credited producer on the F1 movie? I did not know that, but it tracks and that's cool. Did you know that the entire F1 grid, the real F1 grid, appears in that movie as themselves? I did not know that. The genius I to that film wait. is that the fictional team that they are creating yeah. is an 11th team. Everybody else is real. That is so cool. I'm so excited for that film. I'm stoked. Yeah, that's an in theaters watch for sure. For sure. Seeing Fernando Alonso on the big screen yeah. with all of his, you know, daddy energy. Uh -huh. That's a lot to take in for that sure. That might be one to actually go and see one of those like what do they call it? Is it like the 4K? What's the, the new? 40X. What, 40X? What the fuck? Yeah, exactly. Speaking about that roller coaster rides fun. in the movie right. theater. Yes. You want to be jostled fun. around and just have water spray in your face? Just a, just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Every time Brad Pitt comes on screen, a sandwich appears for you to take a bite out of. Just so you can be... Because he eats in all of his movies. Oh, that was a one-to-one. -one. Wow. That was a direct connection happening there. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, that is how we end up with story by credits to Craig and Marks and screenplay credits to Kruger, Singer, and and Macquarie. At this point, with a roughly finished script, they begin the casting process. And one of the first stories of the casting process chronologically is that Val Kilmer, who had been diagnosed with throat cancer in 2015 mm -hmm. and after two tracheotomies had all but lost his voice, mm -hmm. would return. After announcing that he was cancer-free, he actively and publicly campaigned via his Facebook page to be in the movie. Cute. Cruz reportedly absolutely demanded that he be given the part of wow. this man, that he be allowed to return. Having decided that Goose's son would be an important part of the plot, every young actor in Hollywood auditioned. Of course. The final three were Glenn Powell, more about him in a moment, mm -hmm. Nicholas Holt, and the slab of beef that finally oh. got the role, Miles Teller. They were all flown out to spend the weekend with Kaczynski and Cruz at Cruz's house for chemistry tests. Neat. And somehow, somehow... Miles Teller got the job. It is weird, right? Let's talk about Miles Teller. Let's talk shall about we? Miles Teller. Yeah. He's born in Downington, PA in 1987. He has a very comfortable middle-class upbringing. He's involved in the arts in high school. He's president of the drama club. He plays saxophone and piano and drums, famously, and guitar. He also played baseball and had at one time hope of becoming a professional ball player. He studies hmm. at Tisch. He studies The Method at the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute. He's immediately cast in his first feature, the Nicole Kidd movie Rabbit Hole, then appears in the 2011 remake of Footloose. 2014, though, is his year. He appears in Divergent, which everyone thought was going to be a big deal. Turned out oh, to not yeah. be, but even that one that's even not took quite me a second to remember. Yeah. yeah. Then he stars in Damien Chazelle's Whiplash, which right. earns him nominations from several well respected bodies. He goes on to make more Divergent films. He's in the calamitous Josh Trank Fantastic Four movie from 2015, which not even the charm of Michael B. Jordan can save that film. I uh. will say that film is ruined by Miles Teller specifically. Like he is Again. by far the worst thing uh -oh. in a very, very bad film. He's the original choice for Damien Chazelle's follow-up, La La Land, along with Emma Watson 
And say what you like about Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone. There is no way that the Miles Teller, Emma Watson version of that movie been better. is better. No, there is no, there's way no way in hell. He's arrested for public intoxication in 2017, denies Uh-oh. that he's arrested for public intoxication in 2017, only to be publicly corrected by the San Diego Police Department. He's in the Taylor Swift video for I Bet You Think About Me, which I didn't know until today. It was directed by the Internet's new sworn enemy, Blake Lively. And then he's cast in Maverick, and he's terrible. He's terrible. <laughs> he's terrible. He's an active drain on this one. He's the active drain mm-hmm. on this film every time he is on screen yeah i don't understand he also has a huge reputation as being a raging asshole see and that's the part that makes it okay for me to say i don't think he's good in this film because usually i'm always try i try to be careful about that when someone's not good i'm like this is a real person and i'm sure they're trying very hard but if you're also an asshole i can go ahead and say that yeah miles teller not good in this movie but also i will have to put some of that at the foot of the writing because Jesus. Yes. We can separate Rooster those two things out. Rooster is a out. terrible character. Rooster is terrible. ill-conceived. Yeah. But the performance does nothing to rescue yeah. it. The performance, yeah. I think, actively makes actively it makes worse. It worse. I think it's true. probably yeah. like a C-grade bit of writing. Like, just conceptually, Rooster is a bad idea. But yeah. it's a C-grade bit of writing with a D-grade performance. Yeah. The only film that Miles Teller has made since starring in the biggest Tom Cruise movie of all time, being seen by more people on Earth than, like, anyone else who isn't in The Avengers, mm. the only movie that he's made is uh, another Joseph Kaczynski film called Spiderhead, which was shot in New Zealand during the quarantine in 2020. Wild. Never heard of it. And that, I think, speaks volumes, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm glad being that Glenn Powell's getting his complete, day. And that's the contrast. Yeah. Being completely unable to turn this film into anything yeah. is perhaps the most resounding indication of what it's like to work with Miles Teller. Mm. And I, I just can't help but think that this movie would have been better if they had just dropped the whole Rooster Goose's son stuff it doesn't work at all and instead done hangman is the new maverick but maverick has to teach him how to be maverick yeah it's I, I, just a better movie you have to teach somebody which is kind of the story that we're doing with rooster it's it's teaching him to be bold it's teaching him to right. take risks it's teaching him to be the hero of a major motion picture mm-hmm. but it's so crowded out by the fact that he is goose's son that there's no yeah. space for that emotional arc absolutely yeah. you're absolutely and, well, right and the character again this this the, the character and not the performance never proves himself capable of any goddamn thing but messing up not That's one it. thing not one thing there is nothing that makes me believe that he's supposed to be there and inadvertently doing things like his dad used to do them is, is like the only charm that he brings yeah, to the scene yeah. is just replicating anthony edwards like right, right. there on screen yeah. for fleeting moments and and those are just the worst things in the yeah, film too. Yeah, yeah. The moment where he looks at the sky and says, talk to me, dad, is the worst <laughs> thing I've ever seen. It made me physically angry. I had a physical, visceral response yeah. to that moment and it sucked. And this is the thing, we both really like this film. Spoilers, you guys. Oh, we're yeah. going to be having Love a discussion film. about yeah, where yeah, this yeah. film falls in our mm-hmm. top five by the time that we're yes. done with this episode. I really like this film, but God damn, if you could just literally take a razor blade to the film and cut out everything, every moment that Miles Teller is on screen, yeah. this film will be 5 10% better. It would be enough to elevate it into At an least. all-time classic yeah. slot for sure. Yeah. Let's leave him behind. And, let's, and really, yeah. let's, let's, let's just, just make a pact place to start, right now, yeah. you and I, to talk <laughs> as little about him as possible. Let's, How about yeah. that? Okay. Because we could be talking about the brilliant and beautiful Jennifer Connelly, oh, who was lovely. born in 1970 in the small town of Cairo, New York. She starts a career as a model at the age of 10 and immediately gets the attention of Sergio Leone, who casts her in Once Upon a Time in America. She works with Dario Argento on Phenomena the following year and then stars in Jim Henson's Labyrinth in 1986, mm. in which she is fantastic. She sure is. What oh, Oh my film. God. Absolutely. Just outstanding. She graduates high school in 1988. She attends Yale to study English literature before transferring in her junior year to Stanford, where she studies drama, but the movies are calling and she leaves mm. Stanford before graduating in order, in part, to take the love interest role in the excellent Disney adventure, The Rocketeer, yeah. one of my favorite films. So great, of course. Just a great movie. She works pretty consistently through the 90s, including Mulholland Falls and Dark City, but she hits a career high point in 2001 when she wins Best Supporting Actress for her work on A Beautiful Mind. Two years later, she marries Paul Bettany and they become one of those yep. Hollywood couples that everybody likes and everyone <laughs> is glad is still together. <laughs> yeah. Is there even a point in me asking what your thoughts are on Jennifer Connelly? I love Jennifer Connelly. I think she is an all-time great, classic beauty, extraordinary actor, good person. I, I like yes, her. Yes, by all counts, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that in this film, 
I'm sure that she, like anyone else in Hollywood, men and women, have has had some work done, but she does not look like a person who has had work done. She looks just like a natural beauty yes. who is her age. And yes. I love that. It's so refreshing to see. Eight years younger than Cruz, which given the many discussions we've had about his right. love interests in recent films, is frankly refreshing. The yes. fact that it's not a 20-year gap, right. I think, really works for this film. The fact that they are letting Cruz look his age, we yeah, have a little bit of that in Fallout. He looks a little... Yeah, he's definitely had some work done, but he's sure. 56 when he shoots this. He's 60 years old when it comes out, which oh, is, you man. know, Wild. pretty impressive, honestly. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's true. And, and he's looking good in that Tom Cruise way. He's still like identifiably himself. You yeah. Know, he hasn't yeah. transformed, particularly in this film. It's you can so really see striking. Pete Mitchell Maverick. Yeah. Right? To to look at this film and realize with all of this perspective, with all of this vertigo, frankly, mm. that Pete Mitchell was such a character. Because in your head, I think we smooth the edges off and we just make him another Tom Cruise protagonist. Yeah. I think we make all of those 80s guys another Tom Cruise protagonist. And even into the 90s, for some extent, right? Is there really any difference between who he is in Top Gun and Cocktail and Days of Thunder and The Firm? In your head, you kind of blur it and you mm. soften the edges a little bit. But Pete Mitchell is incredibly specific yeah and he really brings him to life in this film in a way that i think is is really lovely i will ask you this i think that jennifer connelly is great in this movie yeah is she the way you would have gone is she the person you would have cast is she a good fit for the world of top gun uh i mean i think that she works for me they don't give her a lot to do i would have liked even more honestly there's something strange for me i, I have just the smallest bit of friction in this movie with Jennifer Connelly, not because she isn't great and just, mm. just magnetic on screen, but because there's something about her which just reads as East Coast to me. She feels like she's from New England oh. and that she's and not her Californian, Diego. you know? Sure. And because of the, the way, blonde. yeah, and the ties to California, right? Mm. I, I feel that. Yeah, they have her in very like Newport News clothes too. Exactly, yeah. right? I yeah, this is saying. this is sure. San Diego, Connecticut. Definitely, <laughs> is where this movie Definitely. is. Definitely, yeah. But only when we're point. with her. Even her house with feels just a little especially. bit. Sail, yeah. that might be it too. I yeah. love that sailboat, though. Spoilers, that is maybe gorgeous. my favorite scene, which is no insane. Stunt work done on the sailing sequences that was actually Jennifer Connelly and actually Tom Cruise, who really hadn't spent a lot of time sailing in his life and really was kind of a noob and kind of nervous when That's he was out there on that thing. Amazing. What a fantastic and I love sequence. It. Oh, in the theaters especially, I did not expect that sequence to happen. And so when it came up, I was just thrilled. Yes, it you, felt like Taylor made for me. You have a long standing like, and well attested love of ships. And Tom Cruise <laughs> on a sailing ship with the sound of the ocean roaring in this, you know, military fighter pilot movie. I was like, yeah. what? I was so thrilled. We've talked about this before on the podcast, mm -hmm. but in case you're joining us, dear listener, for our Top Gun Maverick episode, this was the reason that we decided to do this podcast. We Correct. went to see Maverick in the movie theaters yeah. because we hadn't been to see a movie in the movie theaters for all of COVID, really. Yeah. Like it had been years and years and years. This was a huge release. So yeah. we decided to go see it anyway. Yeah, I don't think we'd been to a movie theater since, I want to say, the second Guardians movie. Wow, it's possible. I think that was that's the last entirely, one that we actually saw together. Yeah, yeah, together at least. I had, yeah. I had podcast commitments that meant I had to go and see a lot more Marvel movies in the movie that's theater than you did. True. And even some DC movies, which yeah. was just boring. Let me yeah. tell you. And you always take the boys to whatever idiot sure, movie is showing for sure. them. You know, the fifth Despicables <laughs> or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> the Despicables. <laughs> that, that great. <laughs> Nightworks. I love Nightworks in the Despicables franchise. <laughs> Let's talk a little about the the really charming Glenn Powell. I'm on record as yeah. not liking Glenn Powell at right. all. I came out of this movie saying, hey, you know what the problem with this movie was? It was Miles Goddamn Teller. You know what the other problem with this movie was? It was Glenn Powell. He does not have the charm that he thinks he has. I have since pretty much completely come around on Glenn Powell. I'm glad. And I have pretty much retconned my understanding of this role. He mm. is doing something that is, I think a little bit more subtle and a little bit more interesting than he seems to be doing on the surface. Yeah. He had to be persuaded, actively wooed by Cruz and Kaczynski to take the part because he felt it was underdeveloped. He mm. had no interest in playing, as he says, quote, a Navy Draco Malfoy, <laughs> which is not just a great description of yeah. his character, but also kind of warms my heart to him yeah. because that's the reference that he chooses, Draco <laughs> Malfoy. Pretty good. Glenn Powell is born in Austin, Texas in 1988. He plays football and lacrosse in high school, during which time he appears in Robert Rodriguez's Spy Kids 3D Game Over. Sure. After graduating, he moves to L.A. He begins auditioning for every TV show in town. He appears in episodes of Without a Trace and CSI Miami and NCIS and 
you know, I don't know, 10 yeah. other shows just Louis like that. He's booking movie roles throughout this period, and they're gradually getting more impressive. In 2016, he makes a minor breakthrough after appearing in Richard Linklater's Everybody Wants Some, which right. you and I just, just watched. watched that. It is yeah. really quite charming. He's actually. great in that. He's yeah. extremely good yeah. in that film. Really holds it together, too, for all that it's a shaggy dog stoner kind mm-hmm. of story. I think he gives it what structure it has. He also appears in Theodore Malfi's Hidden Figures that same year, playing noted and celebrated astronaut John Glenn. Cool. He's basically the second lead in the adaptation of the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society in 2018. Oh, yeah. And then Maverick takes his career to a a whole different, very intentional, some have pointed out, maybe a little cynical level. He's really navigating his career like he wants to be the next big movie star, like he wants to be, in fact, Tom yeah. Cruise. He appears in Linklater's Hitman, of course. Right. He appears in The Absolutely Awful Anyone But You with Sidney Sweeney, <laughs> which somehow still makes a huge amount of money for Netflix. He it's produces a documentary on the Blue Angels, and he stars cool. in Twisters in 2024. That's the big one. And that's the career path, right? He goes yeah. from being the support in this movie to leading man just two years later. Mm-hmm. What do you think is next for Glenn Powell? What kind of career do you see him having? Ooh, I don't know. That's a good question. Whatever he wants is what I'm going to say. Like, he seems to know how to how to game the system and has just said out loud that that's what he's doing. He's like, I've got a little bit of power now, so now I can push that power and do a little bit of what I want to do. He's interested in taking what seems to be interesting work like hitman is not i was gonna say yeah a high profile traditional kind of role but twisters absolutely is right right that, that is the leading man role that perhaps in an earlier era of hollywood that, that he would just be stuck in now yeah. his next movie is a weird free adaptation of kind hearts and coronets do you know Kind oh, Hearts and Cornets? Yeah, kind of. in which Alec Guinness plays eight members of the Degascoing family who are all murdered one by one by a social climbing distant relative. Cute. It's an interesting story, and he's apparently going to play the protagonist in that series, which is maybe the thing that I don't want him to do. But then he just did the I will play nine different characters yeah. in Hitman. So it's going to take some time for his career to shake out, but certainly... Mm-hmm. He really makes a mark with Top Gun Maverick, and mm-hmm. then he absolutely confirms his movie star status with Twisters, I think. Yeah. And if you guys would like to hear us talk about Twisters, you can find that over on the Patreon feed, patreon.com mm-hmm. slash next word for, as I remember it, a slightly boozy, very late night recording. I think that's correct. Right after we yeah. got out of the movie theater, we came home and talked for 90 minutes about Something Twisters. Something like that. At like, yeah, 11.20 p.m. or whatever it was, it was when time. we got out. Yeah, it was a movie that I enjoyed. <laughs> One more member of the sprawling cast absolutely demands our attention. Mr. John Hamm was born in St. Mm. Louis in 1971. He gets into acting early, playing Winnie the Pooh on stage in the first grade. He later Cute. enrolls at the University of Texas at Austin, where he is involved in violence and the injuring of a fellow student during hazing rituals for Uh-oh. the Sigma Nu fraternity. He is put on probation and later transfers to the University of Missouri. After graduating, he gets a job teaching an acting class at his old high school. In that class is Ellie Kemper, who would later go on to star in Wild. The Office and star alongside John Hamm in Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Huh. Yeah. That's Small fun. world. Yeah. Smallest possible I didn't know he was world. in Unbreakable Commissioner. That's neat. He's the cult leader. Yeah. He comes in late in that series. Wild. <laughs> yeah. I've only seen a few episodes and I thought they were very cute, but it just didn't like That's keep me going. basically the show. Yeah. yeah. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> then he moves to LA in 1995 and gives himself five years to make it. He struggles through those five mm. years, but four years later, he lands a recurring spot on the NBC drama Providence and makes his feature film debut in Space Cowboys. Both of these projects together allow him to quit his job as a waiter. From there, mm. he appears in Kissing Jessica Stein in 2001, We Were Soldiers in 2002. Oh, yeah. He appears on every single procedural show shot in LA. He appears famously in an episode of Gilmore Girls. Then in 2007, He's cast by Matthew Weiner as Don Draper in Mad Men. That's the one. One of the best characters, one of the best performances in modern fiction. He is Agreed. nominated for Primetime Emmys eight times mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. finally winning in 2015. And after Mad Men, he works a lot, but mostly on projects which he considers interesting, particularly comedy projects. He's yeah. in Baby Driver and Bad Times at the El Royale and Lucy in the Sky. And then... In 2022, along with Maverick, he appears in Confess Fletch, a continuation of the Chevy Chase series of private eye comedy capers. That film does not amount to that much, but Mm. it is cute. And if you want to see charming, twinkly John Hamm, then that's a good one to watch, Confess Fletch. Hamm accepted the part in Top Gun Maverick without reading the script. As soon as he got the call from his agent, he said, yes, do not waste any time. I want to be in this film. 
And he's pretty great. He's perfect. Yeah. 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 I mean, they're not calling on him to do very much, but he just plays a very convincing asshole. He does play he a very really convincing asshole, which is yeah. one of the things that he actually spends a lot of time doing through his career yeah. is you are just kind of a slightly too handsome, slightly too entitled <laughs> piece of shit. That's just kind of your deal, John yeah. Hamm. It's one of the things that makes Don Draper such a brilliant mm-hmm. character because he also possesses this really interesting sadness at the heart yeah. of his his performance as an actor. I think in, in basically everything, including Top Gun Maverick, it's including, a wild it's how true. he manages yeah. to communicate that ennui, right? Yeah. The, the world is passing and moving on. And the thing that is never articulated by the film is that it's taking Cyclone with it. Yeah. That he is also, you know, passing into the West mm. as the world changes around him. I absolutely love his performance in yeah. this film. For all that superficially, it appears to be not that much. Right. I think he's genuinely great. Yes. We're not going to run through the whole rest of the cast because it is a cast of thousands, but we will note that the cast, all of the fighter pilots, get to choose their own call signs. No kidding. This is a true That's ru- story. Well, okay. That's interesting in a number of ways. All right. Even Powell, because his role in the script, which was one of the few that was named, was originally called Slayer, and he is the one who changed it to Hangman and got the really great. He has the best art on his. He helmet. does, yeah. I that's really fun. love that. Yeah, that's that's mm-hmm. super good. So Rooster, Hangman, Coyote, and Fritz—they fly the single seaters FA eighteen E's. The teams for the two seaters are Phoenix and Bob, Payback and Fanboy, Yale and Harvard. They independently chose their names and just happened to match up like that. And Omaha and. Halo, who I'm not sure gets a line in the script. I was going to say, I don't remember Halo or Fritz. No, yeah, there are very minor parts. Yeah. There are some complaints from members of the cast. I know that the actor who played Coyote after the fact felt as though he had been cut out of the film. He felt as though uh, there's a lot more in the script about the team yeah. and they had really distilled it down. Another thing that we could have gotten if we weren't wasting time with on Miles Rooster. Teller. Agreed. The cinematographer is Claudio Miranda, who had previously shot Oblivion, of course, and Tron Legacy cool. for Kaczynski. As we mentioned on that episode he also shot benjamin button for fincher he shot life of Mm -hmm. pi for ang lee he shot naiad from last year which i haven't seen but i've seen enough of to know is a beautiful looking film and he shot the very good and never previously mentioned tomorrowland for brad bird (laughs) a film that i get maybe we should watch it you should tell me about that i don't know maybe maybe we'll watch it after this recording I am not going to go into the technical details here of the cameras and the lenses and the way that the aircraft are adapted to carry internal and external camera mounts that can withstand high Gs. I can't imagine. Brand new lenses had to be invented that could withstand the G-forces that they were subjected to during this aerial photography. If you are interested in it, dear listener at home, then go and look into it. It is incredible. I will note two interesting things. The actors playing the pilots are trained not just in how to fly these aircraft, how to withstand G-forces, how to navigate in the air and kind of navigate all of this naval technology too but also how to operate the onboard cameras how to think about lighting how to think about sound how to think about editing to touch up their own makeup because when they are in the air they are by themselves they have to effectively shoot this little solo movie Uh come back down and show the footage to the editor show the footage to joseph kaczynski (laughs) and say did i get it or do i have to go back up again As a result, they amass more than 800 hours of aerial photography. That's just the stuff in the planes in the sky. 800 hours of footage is more than Peter Jackson shot for the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy. Holy It is so much. That is wild. Okay. They start shooting on May 30th of 2018 in San Diego. They spend two weeks on the USS Theodore Roosevelt for the carrier sequences. But apart from that and short shoots in Washington State and in Nevada... Mm. The rest of the movie is shot in California. Everything is in California. Principal photography is set to last until April of 2019. That's 11 months, but it doesn't actually wrap until July of 2019. Wow, that's, that's a long 14 shoot. months. That's yeah. wild. Most of the music in the film is by Harold Faltermeyer, of course, who wrote the score for the original Top Gun, which is so Slaps. good. Slaps. It still so holds good. up. It's it just out. Rageous. As soon as we turned it on, or when we we're in the theater too, I remember, and you get that like gong or I whatever it is, just had goosebumps. No idea how deeply those right? sounds were woven into my DNA, but it turns out that I they know. are. Agreed. It's absolutely so hot. so phenomenal. Cool. We should, though, talk about all the rest of the music that's contributed because most of it is very bad. Is that Lady Gaga song the worst thing we have ever heard? It is the worst original song that I can remember being in a film for a long time. Right. And I say this as someone who is not at all a fan of Gaga, but I also think it's one of her worst. I also think that it really stands out even in her body of work 
as like a really half-hearted effort. <laughs> it's just, I can't remember a thing about it other than when it's playing. I'm like, this is not good. I'm surprised that you can't hear like the crackle because of how conclusively it has been phoned in. <laughs> It's so strangely anodyne. And, yeah. And, yeah, just nothing very at all. And first doesn't pass. Match, very AI generated, it seems right? like. Yeah. It doesn't match any of the music no. from Top Gun. It doesn't which is work. nothing but bangers. Like, well, the it's... Top Gun soundtrack is an all-time bestseller. Oh, that's the thing. Yeah. And you think about how iconic Take My Breath Away became. Yep. And I have never heard the Gaga song outside of, like, the three months that this movie was hot. Oh, not even three months. I, I feel, don't even think I, that I feel long, like I right? heard it the week that the movie came out. Yeah. And then it and that was just maybe vanished. It just disappeared. And yeah. it didn't even have any hold in the theater, you know? It, it no. just disappears as soon as you pay any attention to it it vanishes right in front of you i will also take the moment to critique the work of hans zimmer and lauren balf two composers who i really like who do less than nothing with the rest of the score for this movie everything that is good comes from the folder score. i have to say i don't remember anything other than that it so is you're probably right the most cliched orchestral slowed down rearrangements of the stuff that folder did for top gun it is all the little the twinkly piano version of the main oh, theme no, that I plays do like that I can't stand it. No, it works for me. It works for me. It gives it is, me it gets me a little goosebumpy. I it like is it. Such a cliche. It is such a cliche in 2018 when but they are starting work the on this film. Is a cliche. Never mind like 2022. The movie is all about just hitting all those nostalgia buttons. And I think that it but nails it most of the time. That's exactly the problem though, is that that's not a nostalgia button. That is a very like mid 2010s, every single goddamn trailer sounds like that. Every that is single true. trailer. That is the has trailer sound. Yeah. Either, you know, a little girl creepily singing <laughs> right. a child's yeah, nursery. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, or it's yeah. exactly that. That's exactly what the, the Force Awakens has exactly yeah. that happening oh, in, in its I trailer, too. too. But yes. You cannot keep going back to that one. <laughs> okay, fair enough. And of fair course, enough. comparisons with The Force Awakens are not undue, I think, given it's, true. its status as a legacy sequel, mm-hmm. given its status as a huge blockbuster hit. You know, I think there's. Obviously, yeah. Star Wars exists kind of independently of I everything was else. I going to say, and the there world. are like 11 Star Wars films yeah. and two Top Guns. But there so. is a degree of polish and confidence. Like, there's something ineffable. I need to really sit down and work it out. But there, mm-hmm. there is a way in which Poe Dameron would absolutely fit in Top Gun Maverick. And oh it's more God, than just the quality of the heart. performance. Yes. It's, it's something more specific yeah, than that. Yeah, I want Poe and Finn in one of those planes. Yeah. Forget Miles Teller. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Take out Omaha and Halo yeah. or whoever. <laughs> replace them with Poe and Finn. do this. Yeah. Yes. You can fly this. I can fly anything. <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> and The Force Awakens, you guys, turns out oh, to be a pretty good movie. Great movie. The movie is originally planned to hit theaters in July of 2019. You know July of 2019? When they finished principal photography yeah. in the end. Like, so it is mm-hmm. pushed back. That's why, though, they have such a huge presence at San Diego Comic-Con in July of 2019, oh. is that it's supposed to be right on top of the release of the movie. Uh-oh. It's exactly what they did for Fallout. Mm-hmm. But post-production troubles push the movie back into June of 2020. 20 and i don't know if you've heard but things aren't good for movie theaters in the middle of yep. 2020 oh my god what paramount time. and Cruz hold the line refusing to move the movie to right a streaming call. service absolutely right and call let's be clear for all that Cruz talks about believing in movie theaters and saving movie theaters this is because there's no way that this movie makes back a tenth of its budget on there's a no streaming way. service yeah, compared to being it. in mm-hmm. theaters there's some talk of it coming out late in the year it's originally scheduled for november of that year but the premature release of christopher nolan's tenet in september yep. and then the surge of omicron in december yeah. put release plans on hold it eventually comes out in 2022 we'll talk about that in just mm-hmm. a moment because prior to release tom cruise arranges a private screening for himself Anthony Edwards and Anthony Edwards' son. Cute. Edwards comes out of it describing the movie as, quote, mission accomplished. They did it. They really did, though. It's a lot of work that went into that, but it had the feel. It had the tone. It had what people wanted. He is apparently very hot on yeah. the movie. And I think that's, that's just true. Yeah. such a cool kind of menschy thing to do. I know it's yeah. part of a publicity cycle. I'm not naive enough to think that this is just Tom Cruise being right. a good guy for the sake of being a good guy. I'm not sure that Tom Cruise has ever done anything just for the sake of being a good guy that sure. cannot also be leveraged for marketing purposes. <laughs> But certainly, this seems like a cool, cool thing to do. It does, yeah. Top Gun Maverick is finally released on Memorial Day weekend, May 27th, 2022, with a marketing push that isn't just about this movie, but is about saving the movie industry. 
It debuts at number one. It makes $160 million in its opening weekend. That Amazing. is basically the whole production budget. Yes. It's ahead of the fourth week of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness at mm-hmm. number two. The new release of the Bob's Burgers movie, which despite loving the cast of Bob's Burgers and loving the show, I've seen a lot of Bob's Burgers oh, really? over the years. I've never seen that movie. Yeah, I Bob's forgot Burgers that even is wasn't great. Me. Okay. H. John Benjamin, I will, I will watch or listen to anything that H. John Benjamin does. I think okay. he is such an incredibly gifted comic actor. Kristen Schaal's fantastic, of course. Mm. It's it's a really good, solid uh, cast. I should probably watch that movie at some point. The Downton Abbey movie is at number four. Oh, yeah. And animated feature The Bad Guys is at number five. But The Sleeper, The Juggernaut, Everything Everywhere All at Once is at number oh, six yeah. as Maverick opens. Off a budget of $177 million, Top Gun Maverick makes a global box office of $1.5 billion almost doubling the box office take of Cruz's previous movie, Mission Impossible Fallout. It makes more money domestically than Fallout, Rogue Nation, and Ghost Protocol put together. Even adjusted for inflation, it almost doubles the domestic take of the original Top Gun. It is, by any metric, a phenomenally successful film, and by a huge distance, the most commercially successful film of Tom Cruise's career. It is, however, only the second most successful movie worldwide in 2022, behind the inexplicable success of James Cameron's Avatar The Way of Water. Oh, yeah. Which you know, makes, I haven't watched it. I can't really say. It makes an absolute fortune overseas, but Maverick oh, makes more money domestically. That makes sense. Yeah. It's nominated for six Academy Awards. Best Picture, Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Original Song, Best Film Editing, and Best Visual Effects. But it only wins Best Sound. As I mentioned, this is the Everything Everywhere year, which takes Best Picture and Best Editing, which I think you can make a really strong argument. Yeah, naturally. We are not as hot on Everything Everywhere as a lot of people were in 2022, but as an editing project. Did we get to the end? No, we bailed on it two thirds of the way through because it's not good. (laughs) For us. It's not good. (laughs) And it plays its hand so early and so completely. Uh, You know, I haven't seen the end of it. Maybe there is something in the end that that lands the film. I have no I idea, and I, I can't did. imagine. I think I did. It. I think I did go back and watch the last third without you. Wow! And I don't really remember it very Secret. much. <laughs> <laughs> Women talking gets the best adapted screenplay nod that year, and Avatar takes the visual effects win, yeah. which of course it does. And we're not even going to talk about best original song because what a fetuous nomination! What a ridiculous thing <laughs> that is. Maverick does, however, win the much more prestigious AARP Movies for Grownups Best Movie for Grownups <laughs> Award. I'm sure that Cruz has that little statuette <laughs> right there on his mantle. No. Nah. <laughs> Miles Teller apparently shops a sequel idea to Paramount called Top Gun Rooster, which surprisingly was rejected out of hand. <laughs> but in January of this year, Paramount confirms that they are in active development on a third movie with Cruz attached. And apparently, Glenn Powell did sign a contract ordering two additional sequels if they want him. Okay. So they can have him if they want him. Well, I hope they want which him. Which seems like the way to go, right? Yeah, and I feel like what I saw in a bunch of the Twisters marketing and promotion is that those two are buds, that that, Again, that Tom Cruise is the mentor for Glenn Powell. But do you think Glenn Powell is just saying this? Do you think no. this is Glenn Powell? No. Cruise went to the UK premiere of Twisters and right? was glad-handing on the red carpet for over an hour and a half with Glenn Powell, just like repeatedly shaking his hand, talking to every reporter who would shove a camera in his face about how great Glenn Powell is. Again, I'm not sure that Tom Cruise has ever just been a good guy for the right, sake right, of being right. a good guy. So he might but already be are, thinking about Maverick. They yeah. are definitely <laughs> forging too, some kind of public professional relationship, yes. Okay, So That's I cool. don't know. I, I could completely believe that they'll come back for... Yeah, what what would you call it? I guess it would have to be Top Gun Hangman, right? (laughs) (laughs) I have no idea, but I'm here for it, whatever it is. I I think there's a lot to do with that character in particular. And Glenn Powell now has the star wattage to do some kind of passing of the torch, right? Because that's Mm. what everyone kind of expected Maverick to be, is that Maverick would show up and kind of pass the baton to a new generation of pilots. And of course, what actually happens in the movie, as we're about to get to, is that he comes in and proves that he's still the goddamn best (laughs) and no one will ever be better than him ever. Kind of cool. It's kind of cool. Kinda it's hot. kind of the, the <laughs> distillation of, of you know Roger Ebert's hypothesis that every Tom Cruise movie is fundamentally the same. Yeah, he's just a rebel who does things his own way, and people say, "Hey, you shouldn't do things your own way," and then he does things his own way even harder and proves that he was right all along. <laughs> it's kind of what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Although I love the emotional depth that we give to Pete Mitchell in this film. Yeah. Nothing connected to Rooster. Nothing even really connected to Goose. Honestly. But connected to aging, connected Mm. to the idea that he's going to be left with nothing. His isolation is so lovely and and human and heartfelt that that it really works. And of course, Mm. we can speculate ourselves here as Tom Cruise approaches the age of 60 as he's making this film, whether there's some 
I don't know, comparison to his real life and his mm. own personal isolation. And so, an hour into this podcast recording, what do you say we start talking about this movie? <laughs> Let's go. That's not pretty good. We open on the Paramount and Skydance and Simpson Bruckheimer logos and, I mean, arguably the best opening score in movie history. It's so good. And it's basically like beat for beat the exact same opening as the original Top Gun. Almost. Almost. Just yes. enough difference, but it's enough the same that your body just feels... Like Christmas time? I don't know. It's Weird. something really good. There's, like specifically there's like, like Christmas time? Or no, just it's just like this a kind nebulous of warm good nostalgia. <laughs> yeah, that's just like, yes, it just feels good. Yes, we're definitely replicating the, the intro to the first movie. We're, we're playing mm -hmm. the hits, which is going to be a recurring beat totally. as we move yeah. through this film. We do slightly alter the opening text card, which I really like. It's it's very slightly say, altered. It's almost exactly the There's same. There's a right? typo that is corrected in the original title card. Ah. It has the word insure, insure the safety, uh, that spells insure with an I. Oh, which is though we got an insurance wrong. agent to. Yes. Yeah, got yeah, it. Yeah, it's, sure. it's just, it's not quite right. Not what you so meant. So they correct yeah. that to insure spelled with right. an E. And much more importantly, they replace men with men and women. So cool. gender binary, okay, yeah. but at least that's a step forward. Step forward. Right? You could have said it. people. You could have said, said folks. folks. <laughs> Pilots. Pilots. Dudes and dudettes. <laughs> but it, it is at least a step forward. That's and good. then we move through into, you're right, the, these, well, these sepia-toned shots of the carrier mm. absolutely replicate in the beginning of the first film, except not quite as good. I oh, just, you think? They're just not as stylized There's something about as yeah, what tony that scott, tony scott does. 80s hazy sepia tone something something yeah. is just so hot and so cool and this is an homage to it but it's not the exact same thing which is maybe correct but i it feels a little safer it, it feels feel a little, little bit safer. more yeah. like because when we open in the 86 top gun with the tony scott sequence it, it is it is orange and it is black. Like yeah. a lot of these shots yeah. are just silhouettes. It reminds me of, yeah, like you think there's a wildfire somewhere. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And here we're doing some of the same stuff and we're certainly getting some shots that are directly imitative of the original, but mm. we're also, we've got these pops of color and it's all just yeah. a little bit brighter. It's a little bit easier to see. What, it's just a little bit more Newer, accessible. Cleaner. Yeah. In sure. a way that I think kind of does ripple out through the course of the movie. Like Kaczynski is a great visual stylist, I think, mm -hmm. as a director. I think that he's, you know, it's interesting that when he goes to Cruise to pitch the concept of this movie, he doesn't do it with a script. He doesn't even do it with an idea. He does it with a lookbook and yeah. a poster. Yeah. Like he's got the visual sensibility, but that visual sensibility is kind of mass market and it is just maybe a beat or two safer than you would mm -hmm. want it to be. It's maybe what is holding him back from being like, a real genuine auteur in the space because he does exactly the same thing with Tron, which is just like knock the edges off of Tron a little bit. Like mm. Oblivion is not as dedicated to its design principle as it could be, as it should be, arguably. If it was mm. one step more interesting, then maybe it would have just a little bit more substance. And, and it really is like 98% of the yeah. way there, right? It's so close. But it is when you're replicating Tony Scott and that really audacious and stylish and swaggering and frankly, sexy as hell opening to the original yeah. Top Gun. You're just missing the mark by a little bit, but it is still... I mean, devastatingly effective. Yeah. We said everything that we have to say about this opening back in the original episode for the original yes, Top Gun. Yeah. It's Tell all that. still it's here. Perfect. And mm -hmm. you're right, that music just get that Fulkenmeyer score just gets inside of mm. you and we even do the same cut to the afterburners flaring the takeoff from the deck and the push into danger zone yeah. which I don't think anyone was expecting <laughs> and they managed to do this incredible they thing of it. making danger zone sound as cool in 2022 right? as it did in 1986 wild really strange just just powerful powerful stuff mm -hmm. Out in the Mojave, though, Pete Mitchell is in the hangar from American Made. It's basically the self-same hangar from American Made. I can only assume that there are duffel bags full of money stashed behind every <laughs> wall panel in this place. It's got that super sexy living room that's just like right in the middle of it with like the Persian carpet and the awesome leather chair. I love that set. It's hot. It's, it's really, hot, really right? good. And Cruz looks comfortable. Yeah. Which is a really interesting place to start him. And it does kind of zag with our expectations because he looks for all the world like a man retired. He looks for all the world bit, like yeah. he's, he's post the in Navy. In the whitest here. shirt 
a mechanic has it's ever very worn. Crisp. Yeah. <laughs> it's very crisp. Yeah. He's working on his classic plane and we get of course this somewhat self-indulgent pan across the old photos yeah. from the original Top Gun, all the Anthony Edwards. Like he just has a like wall it. full of pictures of Goose is what we're learning. Yeah. About. Including just pictures of Goose and his wife, which is maybe a little weird. <laughs> I'm not sure why you have that. Except just this long-standing crush. And then he takes out that old trusty leather jacket, grabs Hot. his aviators, reveals yes. the Kawasaki. Yes. And then we get the overblown orchestral score of the theme, this uh-huh. orchestral arrangement of the theme, which is not what the Top Gun theme is. It's, a, again, it's a safer, more mm-hmm. commercial, more 2022 choice. I'm okay with just that. just using the original yeah. synth score. It's... I, I don't think the synth score would have been the right call. I'm okay with that. Yeah? yeah. In, the, in this moment or generally? Generally, because yeah. Because we really, do, I mean, we've kind of changed the way that movies sound. Though mm. Even in 86, movies did not really sound like Top Gun. Uh, nothing has ever sounded like Top Gun, that is true. <laughs> but that particular synth sound is so 80s, it would have been hard to bring that back. Maybe it would. Yeah. Maybe it would. The leather jacket is a little controversial. Did you hear about the the, the controversy of the leather jacket? No. The removal of uh, emblems indicating Taiwan and Japan in order to make this movie more marketable in China. You. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's not great. Not great, but yeah. a necessity for the global box office if sure. you're going to make a movie that costs nigh on $180 million. Mm, and yeah. you can't be absolutely certain that you're going to have the domestic box office return. We just live in a, a global marketplace as far as this industry mm. is concerned now. And these concessions are being made all over the place. Yeah. Top Gun is not the first movie to do exactly <laughs> this kind of thing. I'll tell you what that scene did for me is it made me want to get you a pair of aviators for leather jacket season because leather jacket season <laughs> leather is around, the, season. Oh, it's it's around so the corner. It's almost here. We're, and you've we're got here a great leather jacket. In the middle of September and leather jacket season is only a month or two away <laughs> and it'll last about a week. <laughs> But yes, yeah. Maybe we just need to go to Northern Climes. Maybe we need to vacation in Wisconsin just to have oh, an excuse to yes, wear my very excellent leather jacket, which <laughs> was a gift from you because you have oh, excellent taste. Thank you, darling. Yes. <laughs> and then all at once we're into the prologue. He arrives at his hangar only to learn that he's been shut down by Admiral Kane, the mm. treacherous Ed Harris, who wants to remove pilots from the equation and replace the human element with drones and artificial which intelligence. Which is terrifying to me personally. We sure. threw that away as like, a oh, and now this guy won't have a job. But that actually freaks me out yeah it's kind of regressive you can see here the tony scott drafts of the script that's yeah. where dark star came from originally the, this idea ah. of the unmanned uh, you know remote plane that that these pilots would have to take down because only human pilots can outsmart the ai right it's much more of a sci-fi premise yeah. but this is produced during the obama presidency the, the script is created during the obama presidency when drone warfare is at the top of our list of, yeah. of things about which we ought to be concerned. Now, of course, yeah. it's been eclipsed by other things which were more immediately pressing, mm. but let's not pretend that this is not a real conversation that's happening out there. I, I don't love the idea of tying Top Gun to the real military and to like real it. militaristic concerns. Yeah, I don't I'm like I'm kind it. of glad that we didn't do that mm-hmm. story. And where we do that story, where we like touch on those ideas, that it's about the man in the box, right? right. It's about the pilot in the box. I'm glad that it's about individual heroism <laughs> mm-hmm. and individual ability more than it is about you know we can outthink these machines that we ourselves have created and thank god that it's not about the morality of drone warfare because you get right. into really dubious territory right there mm. what do you think of ed harris in this movie it's it's a fairly straightforward role it is straightforward but i love him i always love to see ed harris on something i don't know he's ed harris he just does what he does. Yeah. He's <laughs> looking wonderfully ancient and craggy in this in a really just like steely, flinty way. I think he's cool. He does look like the world's oldest man in this. Ed Harris, 12 years older than Tom Cruise. Wow. He just looks like he never applied sunscreen or moisturizer. You know what I mean? Like, it's just he's a skincare regime. aged by being yeah. a bastard on set all these years. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> That's what you get. <laughs> the other person that we absolutely have to call out here is the fantastic Bashir Salahuddin, who plays a Honda throughout this movie, who just has such oh, a yeah. brilliant light touch. He is has just a light touch. Yeah, he's lovely. I so forgot about him for a second. Thank you for that. warm on yeah. screen. And just... Uh, that a character playfulness. is usually so disastrous, right? Yeah. That is the Jake Johnston character from The Mummy. That is like, we're going to bring in this guy for a little bit of comic relief and a, to kind of a little pop to the pomposity. Exactly. Yeah. Wink to camera is exactly it. He does all of that in the best possible way without yep. ever breaking the integrity of the film. He, he never breaks the tension there. And yeah, what, what a what a lovely warm performance yeah. from him throughout the movie. Maverick gets strapped into his very high-tech flight suit and goes out to take the jet to Mach 10. That is 
in real life, 7,672 miles per hour, 12,500 kilometers per hour. What is it they say in the movie, New York to LA in, in 12 and a half minutes or whatever Yeah, it is. yeah. I don't think they say that in the movie. I think that was in some behind the scenes stuff that we watched. But yeah, 19 minutes, I think, fast. is what they said. Yeah. Yes. Wild. Does any of this work for you? Because narratively what we're doing is well we're creating a sci-fi tension right because the rest of the film is not going to look like this the rest of the film is not going to be like this it's not going to feel like this it's not going to feel that we are we are dealing with the transcendence of technology yeah right we're actually going to be dealing with a a kind of fairy tale of american militarism being on the back foot being overshadowed by these these ghostly fifth generation fighters that the enemy has Mm -hmm. right kind of tying back into how carefully we step around the political discourse surrounding this movie, even in the original film. So it's going to be about the man in the box. It's going to be about the pilot himself or herself. Does this feel like it's in accord with that? Does it feel harmonious with that, that this triumph of technology? Or does it still feel that it's about Maverick? It feels like it's about Maverick. And as a prologue, yes, it totally works for me. And as just a stunning visual sequence absolutely blows me away when he gets up so high that you see the curvature of the earth are you kidding me it feels like space it's it's incredible the word that i have in my notes here is transcendent transcendent sure and as he approaches mark tan as we are moving into this almost it's not you're right it's not a sci-fi realm it is this like realm of transcendent spirituality right that it is something more profound and more human it is something that feels profound in the Mm. most absolute way and then kaczynski does what kaczynski does he manages to find this human moment because maverick says talk to me goose Uh, and you get chills yeah it is so powerful it is this is what cinema is for. Yeah. Like, it's just, I remember being in the movie theater and like yeah. squeezing your hand and just being in this moment of, yes, this is why we are here. Yeah. This is what it's for. This is what we came for. It's absolutely mm-hmm. phenomenal. That very high shot we get, it's obviously just a, you know, a fully replicated CGI shot because I don't think that Tom Cruise is quite ready to shoot in space just yet. <laughs> but that shot that we have of the huge parabola, the arc that the aircraft yeah. has taken, phenomenal. Really, absolutely really cool. Absolutely yeah. gorgeous. And also like, almost upsetting like really uh gave me a sense of real vertigo just what we're getting closer and closer to being capable of what machinery is capable of now it made me think about you know like landing on the moon is what it made me think about just like just this incredible melding of man and machine and it was stunning and i felt the fear and the danger too that was very good. Yeah, they managed to communicate that extremely effectively despite this Very particular stressful. threat being so abstracted mm-hmm. right? because mm-hmm. we don't really know what this is supposed to look like or feel like or or even right. how it's supposed to function. So it's all just communicated to us very directly. We just have this little red number that tells us how fast he's going. Yeah. And then we get his face to show us how worried he is. Exactly. And those two things work and in perfect And then things start blinking concert. and yeah. hollering and alarming in the cockpit. Yes. Yeah. At 9.7, things start to get shaky and he's yeah. really just like juicing this aircraft to, to try to get it all the way to 10. And then, yeah. of course, he has to do the Maverick thing mm-hmm. and take it that step further, yeah. pushes it into a dive, finally hits 10. 10.4 and punches out of the explosion that leaves the dark star this trailing comet across the sky it's which is so also a gorgeous but show. also i can't believe he didn't get in more trouble for destroying that aircraft that had to be how many what <laughs> billions, billions, and billions of dollars, billions of yes. dollars. And we're taking it out of your paycheck a hundred dollars right? a week for the rest of your life <laughs> And then we have, we we punctuate all of this like grandeur, all of this Mm -hmm. profundity, all of this sci-fi excess with the scene of him showing up at the diner. Yeah. Looking like someone who has just, you know, survived the suborbital destruction of his highly experimental aircraft. It's Uh, it's pretty good. It's really cool. It it is kind of. Where am I? (laughs) Earth. (laughs) (laughs) Which is great because that's a real Spielberg shot too. I really like the way that we handle that. It's it's very good. We're doing that thing. And we don't do this a lot because he really doesn't spend time with civilians in the rest of this movie. Yeah. It's much like the original Top Gun. There are only fighter pilots yeah. in the world. Yeah. But it's interesting to see him kind of take a swing at just being this blue collar guy, <laughs> this <laughs> blue collar naval captain who who has his own plane and aircraft hangar. Mm. 
From there, we cut out to him being predictably roasted by Ed Harris and being sure. told that there's no place for him in the future of the Navy, that, that Maverick's the best there ever was. He gives this standard version of, of the bad guy speech about how robots are better than humans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I wonder if... The, the one thing that's weird is that he does not get his comeuppance. The one thing that's weird is that, that he does not come back at the end of the film to be you know, demonstrably spanked by Maverick. Sure. Well, I mean, I think when he flies right over him <laughs> and... You know, blows the roof off the building or whatever. Yes. That's pretty. That's Which a smack in the face for the sure. Closure to the prologue. After we learn, yeah. in fact, that Maverick has been reassigned to Top Gun, mm -hmm. we can, yeah have him taking off and, and blowing the roof off the little shack. Which Joseph Kaczynski in behind the scenes interviews said was real. I'm pretty sure that I've read accounts of how they did that with a cable. <laughs> so I'm not sure how much of this is just you know uh, mythologizing the production of this sure. film, which is always a thing that we're doing yeah. with, with late era crews. You know, all of the stunts in Mission Impossible have to be mythologized in exactly the same way mm. uh, but whether it was real or not whether it was, was fabricated or not it's still incredibly incredibly effective very effective i agree and yeah ed harris so cool. does not flinch mm, which i awesome. think is fantastic Baller. what a so brilliant cool. character choice. yeah yeah so we cut from there to Miramar, to San Diego, with Maverick riding his bike along the runway just like before, again, playing the hits. Inside, we get the shot of Maverick and Iceman from their glory days. We get yeah. the shot that apparently someone took on the deck of the carrier at the climax of Top Gun 1. Then we get the headshot of Val Kilmer today. What do you think about this fake out? This is a fake out that is replicated from the trailer that was mm -hmm. released for Top Gun Maverick, where everything about the beginning of this film suggests that Iceman is dead that he has already died when we come in. That looks like a memorial photograph. I, I don't know. I didn't get that. No? Watching the movie. No. I think that we continue to fake out Iceman mm. all the way through. We continue like setting an audience expectation so that we can then subvert that expectation. I think that we establish this idea, certainly in the trailer, unambiguously in the trailer, and I think even here at the beginning of the film, that he is already dead. But then they're speaking out, in the present tense when they say that you're only here because he brought you that's here. That's the next scene. Oh, it happens successively. So uh, this is what I think is that we then get the reveal of oh wait yeah, no he's not dead so he's soon. just not going to appear in this film and then we do all the texting back and forth and by that point the audience is feeling very confident oh we're not going to see Val Kilmer that yeah. makes a lot of sense the texting was weird you do see Val Kilmer yeah he actually goes to see him and you're like oh okay but he's not going to speak but then he speaks yeah. and you're like oh my god this is amazing he's going to make it to the end of the movie and then he doesn't make it to the end of the movie <laughs> yeah it just seems like the succession of establishing audience expectation <laughs> yeah. so that we can subvert it it's all very powerful like, right. i think it all works i think it's all great story i think the only thing that didn't work for me was having maverick and iceman texting each other on the phone <laughs> it doesn't feel like it they're texters didn't feel right and they i don't know don't text like 60 year old man either there were no minions gifts i didn't see a <laughs> single one you're funny yeah <laughs> interesting None of this matters, though, because we have to go and get briefed by John Hamm. He is Admiral Simpson Cyclone, and he's yeah. going to give us the very best Tom Skerritt that he can. <laughs> It just Oh, beautiful. I don't know. Tom Skerritt had such lovely warmth and like You know maternal. who's giving Tom Skerritt, though? It's Maverick. All of uh, his good morning yeah. aviators when he's up in the air, when he's yeah. actually training, it's very Viper. That it is It feels true. like he really learned from the best. Uh, I absolutely love that. Love it. There is a mission. There are rules and demands which are very complicated, and we're going to go over it four or five times through the course of the movie <laughs> just to make sure that you get it, and we don't have to interrupt the climax by explaining what is happening. Right. It's a dangerous mission to destroy a uranium enrichment plant being brought online by the enemy right. in an ambiguous place that yeah. we're not going to specify that is actually you know, a little bit of Northern California and a little bit of Washington State. Yeah. Don't worry yeah. about it. The twist is that Maverick won't be flying the mission. He'll be training the kids who are, including Bradley Bradshaw, codenamed Rooster, Goose's son. Maverick is Bradley here. Bradshaw is a bad name. A very bad name. Rooster, also a very bad name. <laughs> it is kind of ridiculous that we take the time to mock Bob for his codename. Yeah. <laughs> Bob, not a noticeably worse codename than Rooster. Yeah. Is it just because Miles Teller is a giant cock? I might take that out of the podcast. I might not. Don't take it out. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Maverick is here only because Iceman ordered it, and that deal comes with a hell of an ultimatum. John Hamm really gets to chew on this. You're yeah. going to do this, or you will never fly with the Navy again. Like, he's yeah. really leaning into it. I think it's a fantastic performance. Maverick goes to the bar and texts with Iceman. This is where we get our first interaction here. Beautiful piece of production design. This, this bar, bar is gorgeous. This bar 
was built for this production. Yeah. This is not a real bar. It was entirely constructed. It is based on the I bar in San Diego, which is a real place. Oh, that's cool. The pilots go to hang out when they're, you know, off hours at yeah. Topman. But yeah, the entire building is is fabricated just for this production. It's it's crazy. It's a wow. brilliant piece of production yeah, design. You're gorgeous. absolutely right. Really beautiful. Yeah. We're introduced here to Jennifer Connolly, Penny, who gives us a play-by-play of Maverick's insubordination over the years. We kind of mm-hmm. sketch their history, their implied will they, won't they, I guess they will, but not forever. Well, she's name dropped in the first movie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but here we get to see how it really shakes yeah. out, which is pretty great. And we button the scene with Maverick buying everyone around because he puts his phone on the bar because this is the kind of place that, that celebrates old-fashioned values, right? You don't disrespect a woman. You don't disrespect the Navy. You don't put your cell phone on this bar. It's not yeah. that kind of place. Yeah. Which, again, is leaning into that kind of uh, boomer heroic mentality, it's a little boomer. right? Yeah, yeah, it's a little boomer for sure. Um, the ringing of the bell and whoever that person has to buy around for the whole bar, which is usually like 80 to 100 people, like that'll... Yeah. That'll break somebody. I don't. I don't know. I don't it's, know if that's cute. It's so much money. Right. Yeah. That's like getting a medical bill or something. I was that's gonna like say breaking exactly. your arm, and now you're just Listen. your entire life is sunk. Yeah. Right. From a pint of beer is like six bucks now. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, not there. There, it's still like you know seventy five cents. I'm sure. Uh, right? You I get don't to do know. this boomer mentality because boomer economics are still in effect in San Diego. <laughs> not in real life, of course. <laughs> from there, we introduce the kids, Phoenix and Hangman and Payback and. Fanboy and Coyote and Bob and Rooster and we'll get yeah. Harvard and Yale and to some extent Omaha, Halo and Fritz, except not really. It is too many people. I think that's a mistake. I like the core idea. I like the idea that it's four solo pilots and four teams. You could cut it down to three like pretty effortlessly, I mm. think, and just be left with with the core. But as a team, as an ensemble, I think they really work. But the problem is that, yeah, some of these actors are just much more magnetic right. than some of the others. Do you want to just call out your favorites? Who who really works for you in this cast? We're uh, not, unfortunately, going to get a chance to talk a lot about them. Sure. Um, I liked Coyote and Payback right away, although I didn't feel that their characters were dissimilar enough to always remember which one was which, which was it's very frustrating. I bit, did not like that. That's, yeah, a, that's a mistake. It's a bit of a problem. Uh, that's yeah. Greg Tarzan Davis, of course, who will also show up in yeah. next week's episode on Mission Impossible Dead. Very Reckoning. exciting. And the very charming Jay Ellis. Uh, Jay Ellis, who is, yeah, is I like Payback, who I yeah. really, really like. We should talk, of course, about Monica Barbaro, who plays Phoenix. Yeah, she's the only great. woman and she's great. Yeah. Given not really much to do. Not much to do, but, but you know, she's fantastic. And yeah. Technically, technically not the only woman because Halo is also a woman, but we really, really don't see her. Don't even remember <laughs> you really who have you're to go, talking about. You have about. to go through like, and, like, it's freeze frame much of a problem. It's, yeah. It's just it too many people and then they don't get the screen time that they need. So then it just becomes confusing. Well, but it's one of these things that, that clearly in the script, we we round sure. out this cast and then in the edit it's cut back all yeah. of these actors report filming a lot of stuff that's not in the oh, finished cut of the movie yeah. well with 800 and hours strangely I so. well and that's just the aerial yeah. stuff never mind right? the stuff that the <laughs> yeah no and i wonder uh, it's it's surprising that there was never a director's cut of top gun maverick and now we're really out of the window we're two years later yeah it's, it's kind of surprising that there's mm-hmm. not an extended cut a, a significantly mm-hmm. extended cut i wonder if there's a good behind the scenes material available not behind the scenes but like extra additional Footage yeah, if, yeah, yeah. On the Blu-ray, there are, I mean, excessive numbers of documentaries, but cool. they're all managed. Yeah, they're all, that's the thing, they've right? all got that Tom Cruise sheen on them. Yeah. He has turned this behind-the-scenes process into yeah a, a wing of marketing it's like another in effect yeah. movie yeah exactly exactly and, <laughs> yeah. and it, there's no it never feels you know i was just talking about joseph kaczynski mm-hmm. uh, claiming that the roof of the shed is blown off when the jet flies over it and then yeah. reading online that no that was a carefully arranged stunt and yeah. i'm not sure right now recording this podcast which one of those two things is I true know which one i hope is true but i wouldn't put it past him to just tell stories about the production because yeah. it's we're, we're making movies but we're making myths it's mm, you know when he's thinking, in yeah. this mode and maybe we would get something different if this was a film on the scale of american made but it's not yeah. it's this is tom cruise in absolute blockbuster mode mm-hmm. and i've watched a lot of mission impossible behind the scenes featurettes and i don't ever need to watch one of those again yeah i don't ever need to see the cast and crew congratulate themselves on just doing a great job when there's an interview when there's a round table you were watching was it a Entertainment Weekly, who did the roundtable with the the junior cast of this film? I got so few minutes into it, I couldn't even <laughs> tell you. Yeah, it was something where I think it was called a uh, three rounds with. Yeah, I'll, I'll link so, to it in the show notes. Yeah. It seemed entertaining enough. Uh, yeah, but again, I only saw yeah. the opening <laughs> few minutes, so I can't I cannot confirm. <laughs> Jay Davis comes very well out of it. I think he's, he's Jay Ellis. Jay yeah. Ellis, excuse mm-hmm. me. Yes, right. I'm confusing my Ellis and my Davis. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 just a marketing machine. 
Yeah, and definitely. And I'm sure that there are fabulous stories that come out from the set, but we're not going to get them in behind the scenes featurettes that are carefully managed and edited and, right. and sanitized by the studio and by, you know, the stars themselves and the Tom Cruise machine. Mm. Do you like this introduction of these characters? Do they feel harmonious? No. Because this is basically their introduction to themselves. So we yeah. get this like potted bio as they come in, yeah. you know, two by two, like the the dwarves arriving at Bayonne's right. house. Yeah, no, 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 no. This is all clunky. There's too much exposition. It's a little happy with itself, like at the bar and playing the pool. And I just don't buy these people as people yet. It just feels like day one of summer camp in a way that I just, I, I don't know. For I don't some, know. I, I can I just say that this scene does not work for me at all, especially Glenn Powell, who I later think is brilliant, but he doesn't work for me in this sequence just what at all at all. a douchebag. He is right? by some distance the worst human being in this scene until Rooster starts playing Great Balls of Fire on the piano. <laughs> if you tried that in a real bar, my dude, And everybody you did at least groan, seat. right? Yeah, but then they're all joining in like, oh, isn't this fun? Isn't this great? Like, no... This film is misunderstanding what makes that scene great in the original Top Gun, yeah. which is that it is cheesy as hell. You should not be doing that. Yeah. And Anthony Edwards isn't playing for an audience of his peers. He's yeah. playing for his wife and his kid and his friend. Yeah. Like yeah. it completely misunderstands what is charming and warm. What is charming and warm about that scene in the original Top Gun is that it is not good. Yeah. <laughs> doing it here and trying to make it not just good, but also cool and likable. Stupid. Oh yeah. my God. It doesn't work. Though you're right. It's, it's, Oh, I don't know. It's a real coin toss. Which one is worse between that or Hangman putting on slow ride and then playing pool without looking, which is just <laughs> yeah. so dialed to 11. Yeah. We don't need that at I all. I do like uh, calling Cruz an old timer at the bar, like seeing Maverick there and like, thanks, old timer for the round of beers or whatever. Like, all that is cute. And yeah. so the next day when he comes in, they're like, oh, shit, I literally threw this man out of a bar last night. It's cute. Maverick's card is inexplicably declined just so we can yeah. throw him out onto the beach. Inexplicably. So that he can stand on the beach and look back into the bar and watch Rooster play Great Balls of Fire and remember how great it was when anthony edwards did yeah. this the movie suffers it, by this one is too here. much yeah yeah, yeah. yeah uh, no, uh, most agree. of the time when they're like playing the hits it totally works for me but this one is too much like had he played even just a different song so it's like oh uh, even that's really close i don't know it's it's a little, no, it's I, a little I, heavy-handed i think you have good instincts there i think you're absolutely right that had he played a different song and we had flashed back to right. the great balls of fire that would have mm -hmm. been enough yeah, that would have been, you know, that would have been enough. We don't have to have this. I don't know what he's even supposed to be. 28 year old guy here yeah. playing a song that was old when it was played in the movie that happened right. 40 years ago. And rocking this weird look that's so Magnum P.I. Like, it's just yeah. odd. All of it is strange. All of the ways in which we replicate Goose in Rooster. Yeah. All of the visual text, the goddamn mustache. Yeah. The Hawaiian shirts, the things that he says to Maverick. All of that sucks I and should so never have been in the script. Yeah. It, it's actively disrespectful to like, <laughs> the memory of Goose, a fictional character, yeah, which is a weird you. thing to even say. But yeah, none of that works. Not least of all because this kid was tiny when his dad yeah. died. It's not like he grew up and got to know his father and is consciously emulating right. him. It's it's given this like the, the, this Jungian subconscious, right? right it's just right. his dad manifesting himself again in the sun, and it absolutely sucks. Let's cut ahead to the briefing the next morning in front of the world's largest American flag. It's ah. genuinely very large. We haven't yet talked about the brilliant Charles Parnell as Warlock. Oh my God, he's so cool. He's so he is awesome. Good. Yeah, I every really really enjoy line, him every yeah. moment. And as an adjunct to to John Hamm, right? Mm -hmm. As doing the kind of Tom Skerritt, Michael Ironside thing yeah, yeah, that they did back in the right. first movie. But he's again bringing this like this warmth and this yeah. intelligence. Mm. He's such an intelligent actor. He really plays that on screen. Definitely. Absolutely love it. At, at the briefing, we learn that half these pilots will go on the mission, but only one will lead the team. This is when Maverick walks in. Hangman has the same reaction to Maverick as Maverick had to Charlie in the original movie. Right. But he didn't try and pick Maverick up at the bar. So it's not quite the same. We're kind yeah. of playing the same shit. Yeah. I mean, he did the same physically throw here. him out into I the sand. I guess you know so... what? He literally picked him yeah. up. Yeah. You're a genius. <laughs> This is, I didn't really mean this it is that high way, level but film yes. criticism <laughs> happening right here. Maverick literally throws out the rule book because subtext, literally. to quote Garth Marenghi, is for cowards. <laughs> and then we cut out to the first <laughs> dogfighting sequence. Maverick yeah. lays out the rules with I'm his best. I'm glad they get best. straight into the plans. It's, it's really yeah. good. Yeah. And he lays out the rules with his best Tom Skerritt inflection while the Who plays on the soundtrack, which is actually yeah, great. Yeah. Won't Get Fooled Again is an excellent choice for this <laughs> sequence. 
And the aerial photography is just astonishing. It really, really is. As stylized and intentional as the Dark Star stuff is in the prologue, Mm -hmm. this immediately feels like Top Gun, but better in every way. I I, I cannot say anything bad about the aerial photography throughout this sequence. It's so cool. And again, like almost upsetting in the ways that it's very stressful on your body watching this happen. Yeah. And knowing that these actors, yeah, are feeling these G-forces. Oh, my God. In many, many cases, doing it for real. Not everyone in every shot. And, of course, there are like... 2800 visual effects shots right. in this movie like it's it's it uses a lot of cgi but the decision that was made was simply that we're not going to use cgi unless we have to right so we try and do as much in camera as possible awesome. and a surprising amount of of these flying sequences are just done in camera which is yeah just just astonishing so cool and that's really an argument for tom cruise being tom cruise because i don't think that anyone else gets this movie made Marvel movies have a similar kind of budget. DC movies mm. have a similar kind of budget, but they shoot in a green screen box in Atlanta. Yeah. None of that stuff is real. Yeah. The argument for making things in real life is really the Tom Cruise argument. Is the Tom yeah. Cruise justification at this point in his career. And for that, if for no other reason, I'm glad that he's still making movies. Applause, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Back on the ground, though, it turns out that Rooster, against all expectations and, you know, narrative common sense, he isn't pissed about Maverick killing his dad. (laughs) He is pissed because Maverick delayed his application to the Naval Academy and set his career back by four years. Yeah. Why is this the heart of the storyline? It's odd. Why do you make the choice to deflect the very powerful narrative momentum that you already have in this relationship to do something that is, at best, abstract? Yeah. Right. He stalled some paperwork so that he so that Rooster is four years behind in his career trajectory, even though there's no indication that he's any older than any of these other pilots. No. So apparently he's fine. Why does the film make that decision? I think it really works for me when he tells Penny about it. When he tells Penny that he held the held the papers because his mom never wanted him to be a Navy pilot and he was making a promise to her, like basically on her deathbed, that he was going to try to keep this kid out of trouble and that he feels like he has this like, you know, life debt because of the loss of Goose. So that worked for me and I found it quite heartwarming, this idea that, that he let scene. him yeah. resent him and blame him and never told him that it was his mom's wish, not his own. Because it does make a lot more sense that Maverick would want to, like, train him up, you know, than he would want to push him out. Yeah. I I mean, I think you can interpret that Mm -hmm. either way. Certainly, Maverick never really articulates an argument against being in the Navy. It seems as though being in the Navy, being a naval aviator specifically, is the best thing to which a human being can aspire. That's what he says. Yeah, he says it's not only who I am. It's not only what I am. It's who I am. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not sure about that it just seems it's messy unnecessarily yeah. complicated yeah. E- everything with rooster is just first pass it's it, it not, is underbaked none of it yeah. works unfortunately up to and including his name yeah. maverick is brought to jesus by cyclone and he argues that these goddamn millennial pilots are resting on the laurels of their participation trophies <laughs> we get this real like boomer perspective on the problem with kids today yeah. is that they just don't try it turns out that none of these pilots are equipped to fly the mission as outlined. No one could possibly fly this mission as mm-hmm. outlined. Mission impossible? Hold that thought. Hangman and Coyote <laughs> figure out the goose plot line while Maverick goes back to the bar to pay off his giant, giant bar tab. Yeah. It would be interesting, actually, to count up the number of heads in that shot to remember that it happens twice. And then to, uh, well, I don't know. Is it implied that there's also a second round attached to him yes. being thrown out of the bar? Uh, I don't remember. She definitely clings the bell twice yes but I don't the remember first why. time is for putting his phone on the bar and he right. has to buy everyone a drink and then the second time she clangs it that is the sign that he has to be carried out and thrown onto the beach I yes guess. does that also come with a round of drinks i and don't we know. can only assume an Confusing. automatic 20 percent gratuity right? <laughs> definitely tom cruise just put jennifer connelly's kids through college right, right. There. that's what just happened Penny has to take her sailboat to the sailboat garage to have its sailboat engine repaired. So Maverick, of course, volunteers to help, and we get the hottest scene in cinema history. Elizabeth, do you have feelings? It's so good. I have huge feelings about it. It's (laughs) terrific. I, God, it was such a thing to see in cinema. It really was, like, in the theaters. Amazing. I'm so glad that the scene exists. I wish it were longer. It lasts, like, 45 seconds, and that's not enough. It's it's real short, yeah, Yeah. but also real lovely. That is a behind-the-scenes featurette that I would just watch. Yeah, I would watch that entire movie. I want the the (laughs) rom-com that's just these two sailing, please. Let's talk a moment about Liliana Ray, who plays Amelia, 
Penny's sure. daughter, who I guess is never implied to be Maverick's daughter, which is an interesting zag there. Oh, yeah. No, definitely it not. It would be okay to yeah. leave that open to some ambiguity, but instead... Nah. No? Yeah. You're, you're happy not to do I'm that. I'm happy not to do that. Yes. <laughs> She's quite good, I think. Actually. She's quite good. And the, yeah. the writing is not as disastrous as it so often is for characters of exactly yeah. that song. Yeah. She doesn't need to exist, but yeah. it's fine. <laughs> yeah. We'll circle back to like her one moment of friction with Maverick right. in a little bit. I so often just like hate this character. Like, why do yeah. we have the angsty teenage girl that's just wanting to stand in the way of her mother's love life? I hate this. And, then, you know, it's not so bad in here, but I could do without it. Yeah, no, I completely agree. But I think, it's, you're, it's, I think you're right. The actress does a nice job. Yeah, it's so yeah. often done so terribly. So oh even when it's adequate, even when it's yeah. inoffensive, it feels like such a win. It feels like such a breath of fresh air <laughs> that you manage <laughs> right. to just dodge the obvious pitfalls here. Maverick briefs the kids the next day. We have to fly less than 100 feet at 750 miles per hour, all at high Gs. They practice the run over and over, but, you know, Hangman is reckless and Rooster is indecisive. And we sketch characterization for mm-hmm. at least two or three of the other pilots, too, until tempers boil over in the briefing room and Hangman goads Rooster into attacking him. This is when Maverick has his crisis of conscience, his crisis of confidence, in fact, and goes to see Iceman, just like he went to see Viper in the first movie, right? Yeah, it's yeah. exactly the same yeah. point in the movie. It, it rhymes, to borrow a George Lucasism. Uh, this, I think, is really lovely right we, mm-hmm. we get to see val kilmer who in real Beautiful life we're so sequence. concerned about anyway because yeah. of his terrible terrible health problems he's fantastic in this film yeah. i love even the the device of using the computer screen to give these messages that we can just keep coming back to and the way that this is written that maverick keeps responding to what has been written right yeah. <laughs> Iceman will type this very simple thing and maverick will keep responding to it as though the conversation is happening in yeah. his head it's really beautifully it's done. Quite really nicely written. Actually. This yeah. sings of Macquarie. I'm, I'm mm. absolutely certain that this scene was written by Christopher Macquarie because it's got that that confidence of characterization that so yeah. much of the rest of the film doesn't really have. And then Iceman talks, and it's yeah. really moving. And then it ends on this really touching joke, I suppose, where Iceman asks him who the better pilot is. Oh yeah. And Maverick responds, "Don't ruin this beautiful moment." <laughs> yeah. That's cute. It's really nice. That's and sweet. again, yeah. production design for days. Totally. Here's an unlimited budget. Just go and make a room that is beautiful yeah. and, and bespeaks character in every yeah. way. Yeah, it's one of those moments that just makes you want to be great at something, that makes you want to like execute excellence. This moment where Iceman tells Maverick that he has to let it go. He has to learn to yeah. let it go. And we just hold on Cruz's face as he confesses that he doesn't know how. Yeah. And he is playing the 40 years he, he absolutely is nails it everything that he has done he's playing his entire filmography mm. in that moment and it's a it's, it's a phenomenal performance yeah. it is just you know you can take away from this film a number of different perspectives on Cruz as as an actor as a performer as a movie star certainly yeah but i think that his character work in this film is undeniable and better yeah. than it has been for God, uh, more than a decade. Mm-hmm. And because we love Ethan Hunt in this house. We love Ethan we do. Hunt. Yeah. But Ethan yeah. Hunt is not a character. Right. And we love the American way that Pete Made, Mitchell but that was also. Yeah, yeah. Barry Seal is not a character yeah. in the way that, that Pete Mitchell is a character and is mm. the same character. Yeah. There's something very quiet and forlorn and, and uh, tragic is too much because it's not really tragic. Yeah. But there is something sad. There is a little lost. Exactly. Yeah. And, and and a kind of reflection, a, a meditation on the price that has been paid right. for being the guy that he is. And, mm-hmm. and would he have made different choices? No, he wouldn't have made different choices. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that it doesn't come with a price. I think this is an absolutely phenomenal performance from Cruz. And, and we'll probably circle back to that again right at the end of the movie. But yeah. hot damn, like... He's going to win an Oscar at some point. It is probably I inevitable so. at yeah. this point. He might win it for a movie or he might just get one of those Lifetime, Lifetime Achievement, Achievement Awards. Yeah. <laughs> where the Academy recognizes, oh, we should have given it to you back in 1994. <laughs> well, yeah. not for Cruise in 1994, but, you know, yeah. we would pick something appropriate. But he will win an Oscar mm. at some point within the next few years. And it could have been, I'm going out on a limb here and I'm really looking for your verification for your perspective on this. It could have been for this movie. Do you think he gets at least nominated in in your perfect world? Does he get nominated for a Best Actor Oscar? Mm, I mean, it's so hard to say. The Oscars are so stuffy and strange. A Best Actor award in some other award show, yes, sure, definitely. Sure, the SAGs or yeah, Critics' Choice yeah, or whatever. SAG, yeah, SAG is definitely right. Absolutely should have taken the SAG. From the AARP movies for Grown Ups Award. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite awards body. I'm not even kidding now. This is a real thing that's happening. 
And from there, because we are playing the hits, we cut out to the or is that volleyball sequence? The yes, <laughs> weird the two ball, football. simultaneous yeah. attack and defense sure. football match on the beach. There are stories from the set <laughs> that are harrowing about this. Oh no! Because everyone, of course, gets into shape. Uh, Glenn Powell talks really charmingly about how packed the gym is. The gym is just full all night long with the guys working out. There's this real like uh, competitive spirit about who looks better shirtless and they're uh -huh. all like really cramming these last workouts and everybody is dehydrating themselves so that their muscles pop yeah, so they're gross. so like, vascular and hot and whatever. Like, just this ridiculous that, Hollywood okay. excess of, yeah. of, of cut muscular masculinity, right? So they go through the whole thing. They finally shoot it and then they all go out and they <gasps> absolutely gorge themselves no. burgers and milkshakes and and mistake. they just eat late late into the night and it, it is a mistake they all feel terrible yeah and then five days later tom cruise comes back to them and says it didn't work it didn't cut together it didn't look as good as we need it we're gonna shoot it again <laughs> and they all have three weeks to get themselves from this you know relatively like bloated and, and yeah milkshake laden yeah. <laughs> build back into the hottest shape they've ever been in ever hilarious everything that we see in the film is apparently from the second shoot <laughs> they funny. just didn't like yeah. the first time uh -huh. at all Sometimes really it tough it looks gig. great though and they do all look great i'm not one for that like super ultra muscled look but it's yeah. a fun hot sequence i'm so glad that we did it because yeah again this is what i mean when it's like playing the hits but not it's not a volleyball game but they're on the beach they're playing football like we know what it is they're referencing it's not the same song that they're playing but oh the heart is God. there this is an example of the soundtrack to this film yeah, really suffering by comparison yeah. this is no playing with the boys this yeah. is I, I don't even remember what it is i don't it's either real bad yeah, it's true it's too bad it's true no one's buying this soundtrack no on, yeah no. <laughs> not that anybody does that anymore interesting I, guess, I suppose is that i don't know they put the barbie soundtrack on vinyl so that's a that's rare true. exception but yeah. but yeah but yeah but you would think that Top Gun 2 would be one of those rare exceptions. It wouldn't surprise me if it had a vinyl release, but certainly mm. no one is talking about it now no in the way that people well. are still kind of talking about the Top Gun soundtrack. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. we should definitely put that on we, our Christmas I wish list. I believe that we had this conversation during the original Top Gun oh. episode and we just haven't pulled the trigger okay, on it yet. Okay, we got to do that. So maybe we should, maybe just celebrate the end of this uh, particular podcast yeah. project. What I like here is that you're right. We are playing the hits. It is the volleyball scene again, mm. but it's not the volleyball scene because right. what we're doing here is team building. Yes. It's not this dick swinging competitive matchup of, of egos it's yeah. this very different purpose it's a very different intent and the yeah. collaborative nature of of you know the football game that is simultaneously attack and defense so everyone's running and everyone's racing and then for maverick to step back from it mm -hmm. is a moment of unexpected humility and i understand that narratively we're having him step back from it so that he can be yelled at by john ham a little right. bit more and then say look i build you a team yeah. exactly but what's really happening there i think is is this separation. He's realizing that this is yeah. not his time, that, that that he plays volleyball in jeans. Yeah. And these guys look, yeah, cut and hot in a way that no one in the original Top Gun looked. <laughs> like just the standards uh, have shifted. No, sure. I know. Everyone in that movie is extremely attractive and extremely I was muscular. Say, they look pretty great. But the world is just different now. Yeah, I know. We just mean. have what was already an unrealistic yeah. aspirational uh, depiction of masculinity has now been compounded eight times over, never more so by, by the Marvel phenomenon. Mm, either. Yeah, that's a point. So as you say, Cyclone shows up and Maverick demonstrates that he has, in fact, created a team. Mm. Maverick then takes Penny home. They have this gauzy crossfade sex scene, which is yeah. really charming. I, was, I found that a really lovely sequence to see in cinema. Again, I keep saying in cinema, and I mean like in the theater. Yes. Just because, yeah, it did just kind of normalize hot sex between people over 40 and i feel yeah. like you never see that that's not in any way yeah played for a joke or no exploited. or exploitative in yeah. any way yeah particularly you know cruise was just shirtless really well we just done. did that thing yeah <laughs> we don't have to do it again here and we yeah. don't have to objectify the extremely beautiful jennifer connelly right in any way it, it's it's yeah, if really anything lovely. they objectify her a little less than i wish that they would yeah. because like even the thing where he's like watching her butt when she walks away but they've got her in like shitty baggy pants yeah. i'm like what are we doing yeah <laughs> It could be. She's hot. Just yeah, let her be hot. We, we could <laughs> dial that up five or ten percent. I think more so. For, yeah. Sure. And this is obviously so emotionally connected too. We, we, mm. Again, echoing the first film, but this is the the confession scene. This is where he talks about yeah. about Meg Ryan not wanting <laughs> not wanting uh, Rooster to become a naval aviator before she died, mm. and how he's honoring her memory, which. It's just really sweet and good. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. it doesn't work for me from Rooster's perspective at all, but from Maverick's perspective, I think it's actually really I quite strong. I agree. You strong. just need Tom Cruise to be able to sell it because he, the thing that, again, I think is too often unsaid, 
He's a really good actor, guys. Yeah. Like he's good. And again, playing the sadness here too. I like think he understands he plays the that it was so beautifully. an imperfect choice. Yeah. That he's not proud of what he did. Like he 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 made the choice yeah. that he made and he would make it again because Merrick does not change fundamentally. Yeah. But he does recognize the price. He does recognize the cost of that that mm. choice. And then we get this little comedy skit about him climbing out of the window to avoid Amelia, yeah. who Which inevitably sees him and says, just don't break her heart again. Yeah. I mean, it's informed, of course, because I like it better where they just had like this little twist or, or they were sweethearts or whatever back in the day, 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 sure, like, you yeah. know, before we even got to Kelly McGillis. But now we've informed that they try to get back together again at some point. Oh, yeah. Point, no, and before and after. Out, that so, they keep yeah, trying to get back they, together Exactly. Again. They keep kind of orbiting each other and then yeah. you know, burning out because... You know, he doesn't even know that he's been gone for three years. He doesn't even know that he's been working on the Dark Star project for three years. Right. Or he doesn't realize that it's been that long because that's not what he cares about. Mm. She's kind of incidental to his experience, yeah. even though his feelings for her seem to be, yeah, authentic, seem to, yeah, be, seem to be real. Yeah. But that's enough sappy emotional stuff because the mm -hmm. target we learn is coming online early and Maverick has to brief Naturally. the team yep. about the odds stacked against them by this particular version of the Death Star trench run, I guess yeah. is what we're doing. <laughs> it's <What's>... cool <laughs> though. Like it works for me. And it's the fact hot. that they're able to communicate it really clearly yeah. and that it looks fucking impossible. Like it does look too difficult and it gets to really showcase what these pilots and what this aircraft can do is cool. well almost what this aircraft can do right one of the small details that we get here is that flying this mission will probably will break the aircraft ruin the yeah. airframe forever that's like, so cool that is just such such brilliant narrative yeah. tension folded into the uh, whole thing it, it's yeah really yeah. really strong. well and i love this tension too where cyclone is like much less concerned whether these pilots will come back from this yeah. than he is that the job can get done Yes. And Maverick it, is like, I am bringing these pilots back home. I am teaching them to survive <laughs> this mission. It's cool. Which we're, you know, seeing in light of the, the memories of Goose as being right. a part of Maverick's character. But it really feels like this is the one thing from Ethan Hunt that, that yeah. Tom Cruise wasn't able to shake. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's sure. Part of his modern movie star persona is that he will not let anyone die. He will yeah. not let there be any collateral damage. We don't really talk about that at the end of Top Gun because mm. the end of Top Gun is all about him learning to like overcome his fear and be reckless again be yeah. maverick again yeah that's it's, right <laughs> we're just kind of informing that now but mm. you know he's he's 40 years older so mm. we can we can justify that uh, this is also where we're emphasizing the man in the box this is where we're right. really doubling down on it's not about the aircraft the aircraft are probably not going to survive this mission and right. they're not as good as the enemy aircraft anyway yeah. it's all about these individual pilots it's this this perspective on individual heroism and the great man theory of history mm. the kids practice the run but it isn't easy coyote blacks out because right. of the high g climb and spirals that into the desert really harrowing and Did a not great like moment that. didn't like it yeah. but that was nice yeah, yeah. I, I love you know really <sighs> putting maverick skills to the test here he has to get a weapons lock because yeah. he knows that that warning sound will, will wake him up rouse yeah coyote, and that's exactly what happens Smart. it's really great and then maverick and phoenix get hit by birds which we call bird strike but when the planes are flying at 750 miles an hour and a bird is a bird, <laughs> I feel like it's more of a plane strike. I hear what you mean. And it, it is one of the things you're like, God, are you serious? Like birds can take down <laughs> these planes and it just seems insane. But uh, yeah, harrowing. Yeah. And Phoenix is no Sully Sullenberger. So her plane goes down and she has uh, to punch mm -hmm. out. Somehow in the next scene, Rooster manages to make Phoenix and Bob's close encounter with death all about him yeah definitely because some people are just like that I and guess. again he never shows any actual talent or exceptionalism as a pilot it's all at informed. all it's He's all here. informed yeah That's in fact all it's, it, in fact we're having to teach him how to do it and once he gets picked for the team inexplicably because why because he's goose's son then he sucks yeah yeah <laughs> and almost kills everybody yes and then Almost kills himself, and it's just stupid. I'm sorry. Yes. I know we weren't going to talk. I know. <laughs> it's hard not to, because it really is such bad a miss. In it's such a miss. Yeah. yeah. I wish that he was great. That I mean, it just, it just doesn't work. I, don't know. I, I think even a fantastic performance, even if we dropped an actor that we really love into this role and he really delivered on it, I still think that it is conceptually flawed. I agree. Yeah. And and would be a drag on the film. But yeah, and that, compounding and that's really what I mean. I'm really not talking about Miles Teller. I'm talking yeah. about. Sure, just just Bradley Rooster Bradford as written. Rooster. Yes, yeah, just, yeah, just not Bradley so. Rooster. I keep doing that, but anyway, yes. You like putting the code names at the end. Yeah, I yeah, don't know why. I, I'm into it. Anyway, it's, it's, it's an wrong. orthodox approach. You know what? It's a maverick approach. Nobody gets to tell you what to do. You're going to turn out to be right at the end. <laughs> 
So this is where we conclude the three beat of worrying about this whole thing about Maverick pulling his papers. Right. With the the awful turn, as Maverick is informed that Iceman has died. Yeah. Which is genuinely affecting, partly because we've been doing that bait and switch with the audience right. and Iceman all the way through. I think it's mm-hmm. enormously powerful. Cutting out to the funeral is just... Yeah. A heartbreaking. Really, really beautiful sequence. Mm. Yeah. What do you think of the, the punching of his wings into the top of the coffin? It's such it's so cool. A gorgeous yeah, shot, but emotionally so representative. And something too. that was in the trailer, but you still managed to kind of forget when you're watching it. So it Because really... in the trailer, they really trick you into thinking the nice man is already dead. Yeah. So you're worried, oh, one of these pilots is gonna die. Ah. And if you watch the trailer and you're coming in with that memory, and yeah. then you get, you know, Rooster going into that spiraling dive, or you get Coyote blacking out, or you right. get Phoenix getting hit by the bird. You're like, you you're waiting for one of these guys die. to die yeah. in order to like pull the team together, right? It's the Phil Coulson effect. Right. One of these people will die so that everyone else can put their shit aside yeah. and be a team and save the day. And that's not what happens. It's mm. a real subversion of audience expectations. It's, but it's a very smart bit of screenwriting. Yeah. It's mostly represented by the editing process, of course. <laughs> but with Iceman gone, Cyclone is taking over the mission mm. and Maverick is grounded and he's making the mission much easier. You have more time. You can fly more right. slowly. You can fly at an increased altitude because it doesn't really matter if you make it back, dear pilots, only that you succeed in destroying this Awful. uranium enrichment yeah. facility. I love that it's everyone there great. sees right through it immediately. They do. That's really good. Yeah. yeah. And and then they suddenly realize what a great teacher Maverick has been all along. Like, and not only a great teacher, but like, what do they call him? A stand-up guy. Yeah. Like, but we're also doing this perspective on, you know, the heroism of our military men and women because mm. they're still willing to undertake the mission, understanding that it yeah. has now become a suicide mission. Right. Now they will survive the approach so that they can accomplish their goal. Yeah. And that's just a thing that has to happen, right? Mm. This is this is that's significant true, at this enough. point. They're still not certain it can actually be done. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Well, Maverick is about to prove that, I was gonna say, that it can be done, which is so cool and so sexy. And you a plane, see it coming, but it's awesome anyway. He demonstrates that it can be done in two minutes and fifteen seconds. Yeah. Don't lower the bar. Set the bar high and let others climb to reach you. Take that, you stupid John Ham. <laughs> How about that? It's cool. Cyclone, of course, gives Maverick one more of those speeches. Yeah. <laughs> You're reckless, but I like you, but I love you. <laughs> is he supposed to, at this point, have Maverick dishonorably discharged? Or is he supposed to appoint him team leader in the hope that you know his erection will finally subside? <laughs> <laughs> it's so predictable. It's cool. And yet so great. Yeah. And John Hamm has to do this. What is this? Four times in the course of the film? Four Mm. times he has to say, I don't like you, but I respect you. But I don't respect you, but I do like you, but I love you. (laughs) Kiss me, you fool. It's just great. And he does it every single time. Yeah, it's good. Maverick goes to the bar in his dress, navy whites, by the way. Uh, There's no reason for him to be wearing those, except that he really wants to get into Jennifer Connelly's panties. And it works. It It would work for me, too. But it also would work without the uniform. He's in a relationship with this woman. I know, but... Uh, it's just an excuse to have him in the, in the, the dress, dress whites, whites are just outsta- yeah my note says dress whites and it has a heart next to it Best like i'm a teenager military uniform in school right? oh yeah we like, talked about this in top like gun yeah when down. we did the first one we talked yeah. about Absolutely. I think it was in my trailer game. The you Navy know, has the best uniforms. I think this me. is true. <laughs> the aesthetics of the Navy. Oh, yeah. Absolutely superior to the aesthetics of oh, any yeah. other wing of yes. the American military services. Yes. <laughs> if, dear listeners, the in other countries. The romanticism of the Navy. If you have superior. fantastic military uniforms in your country, send us pictures. <laughs> we want to see like the, the whatever your version of the dress whites is. Yeah, yeah. So good. On the carrier, Warlock gives Maverick a word of encouragement. We get this brilliant cavernous shot of them in the hangar right under the deck, which is almost all in silhouette that mm. feels like the opening shots of the original movie mm-hmm. really really Beautiful. strong uh, this is the uh this is where you belong you make us so proud oh, speech, the warlock coming from warlock is just the best so thing. good yeah. we needed it too it made me miss tom scarrett yeah i was really glad to have warlock there oh yeah, what he's a great terrific. performance so good and then such a face maverick picks his team phoenix and bob payback and fanboy and rooster with hangman being kept in reserve i wonder if he will save the day at the end of the movie i'm so glad he does and the way he does <laughs> it with such style yeah, it's, it's, it's really good. It's a great moment, actually. Really and good. I needed it after that much rooster. And then we're into the third act. We're into the action sequence, just like we practiced. We did all of that exposition, all of that practice, all of that training, so that the film can just be on rails yeah. from here until it suddenly jumps off the rails, where we get to a kind of extraneous fourth act, which we'll yeah. talk about yeah. in yeah. due it's course. A, yeah. This sequence of flying across the ocean, flying so low, all of which is oh, real. God. 
they are at some points less than 50 feet above the surface of the water, oh which is God. crazy. With the CGI Tomahawk missiles yeah. flying over the top. Ah, hot. hot. <laughs> Very cool. And we say yes. this as people who are not particularly invested in no. war movies and certainly not invested in militarism, right? No. We're, we're not yeah. a part of the military entertainment complex here right. in the United States. And, and generally that's a, a huge turnoff. But goddamn, some of this iconography is just incredibly, incredibly cool. Uh, also, we're still calling them Tomahawk missiles? Yeah, I guess so. Is that cool? Uh, <laughs> that feels like some cultural know. appropriation. Yeah. I genuinely don't know if there's discourse in the real life military about whether know. these names are That's cool or not. Yeah. And then, unfortunately, Rooster chooses this moment to say, talk to me, dad. And it's the worst moment yeah, in film history. You said, yeah, it's not good. He's just, I think I have notes in a row. <laughs> What's it say? But did Rooster ever prove himself to be anything but a whiner? And then the next note, you suck, Rooster. Yes. <laughs> like, it's just, he's, he's, it's nothing there. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. And, and, and you're right. A, a really great actor with the right face could make me love him anyway because, oh no, he's not as good as his dad. And now he's in danger because he was trying to be something oh, he's not. And because that's... we're forgetting that he's not Goose. And now there's just a kid in the seat that doesn't deserve to be there. But Maverick put him there. You are but turning get the entire that. movie on its... Yeah, the movie can't pivot to that it at can't. this point. Yeah. That needs to be where you start. Yeah. And that's a really interesting place to start. Maverick's faith in this young man makes him put this young man in danger. That's good. That's yeah. a really interesting story that you could tell with the child of Goose. That, that at least has some, it has some juice. It has that yeah. goose juice. <laughs> gross. <laughs> that is gross. That is really yes. unpleasant, actually. Yeah, My grandmother that. used to make this breakfast, quote unquote, that she called. <laughs> Wait, even no, breakfast listen, is in quotes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that she called goose juice and biscuits. And it was biscuit biscuits, which are terrible. Sure. And like the the drop kind, too. Not the kind like you knead and roll out, but just like the the spiky, awful ones. And the goose juice was just a vaguely caramelized sugar syrup that she made on the stove that was this odd beige color. It was terrible. Why is it goose juice? I have no idea. What about idea. it makes it goose? I, baby? Did it talk to her? I don't know. I, I, I Did it not bet. make it to the third act? <laughs> Did it leave Meg that. Ryan a widow? I don't know. I could do eight it of these. <laughs> <laughs> this sequence is visually overwhelming. Right. Mm. The the transit through the canyons. We practiced all of this and we're aware that they're navigating this real geography over like imaginary geography. <laughs> they're yeah. flying over the desert. So all, all, the, all the moves that they're doing aren't connected to the geography and the right. terrain in the way that they now right. very much are. Which is so cool and so rewarding. Really yeah. outstanding, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, visually so powerful. And the first missile strike is a success, as is the second, thanks to some, I guess, you know, <laughs> luck and guesswork. Yeah, thanks, this is Bob. the one time nice where, <laughs> yeah, this is the one time, I guess, where uh, Roosters does something right. So he does make that shot without having the laser trained on it. So yeah. that's we good. We get this brilliant moment that after the second missile strike is a success and we get that, you know, the, the missile disappears into the vent on the Death Star. It's right. very, very <laughs> yes. We cut all the way back out to the carrier. We cut out to Hangman sitting in his plane and he just gives this little fist pump of yes. Uh, yes, I have a note there. There's Glenn Powell. Like brilliant it's the first character time moment. and he's perfect yeah. right there. Everything from here on out with Hangman is picture perfect. Oh, it's I think, spot you're, on. I think it's you're just completely right. right. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if we're supposed to infer that he learns this humanity and this humility because he isn't picked for the mission? I don't think so. I just think no, that, I don't think that so. yeah. we find him just I think in the process him. of yeah. making the film. We find yeah. him. Yeah. And then we're dodging surface-to-air missiles and it's chaos and it's flares and it's chaff and it's all this stuff. Terrible. Maverick yeah. saves Rooster by dropping speed and deploying his flares. That's a brilliantly effective Very and visceral cool. maneuver yes. there. Yes. But he himself is hit and drops. Cyclone orders everyone mm. home and John Hamm really carries it in that moment of... of this is the wrong thing to do, yeah. but it's the right thing to do. Yes. He and he, really and it is right. Like, yeah, yeah I, I agree. And t some part of me also thinks that maybe that should have been the end, that maybe Maverick's gone is the end. Well, this is the pivot from our, our third act into our and essential fourth act. I don't like fourth acts most of the time. Like most, most of the time, time when we go back. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and the there's fourth... a lot of cool shit that happens here. Don't get me wrong. Like stealing the F-14 is fucking cool. 
Yes. The takeoff off of the tiny little landing strip again and up above the uh, taking off the landing gear like as he just yes. barely makes it over those two <laughs> silos or whatever Which they were. feels cool. a little bit American made having just oh, yeah. watched that movie exactly. with but another I, it was know, cool then, short too. takeoff yeah. and all that. It feels like, <laughs> you're just doing this in every movie now? Because it's cool. It Here's works. the real it's question stressful. though. Is anything about this act improved by the presence of Absolutely Rooster in not. the narrative or Absolutely could we not. just watch Maverick do this by himself? Uh, again, I think Basically, everything about the character of Rooster is yeah. a misfire and does not work. So to move through the plot as quickly yeah. as possible, Maverick on the ground in the snow is attacked by a helicopter gunship, which is closing on him for the final shot when it mm. is destroyed by Rooster, who is then shot down by a surface-to-air missile and crashes. Maverick runs to the crash site. They are kind of reunited. They express their feelings in the way that men express their feelings in these movies by almost fighting and almost kissing. It's a really weird moment. And then they go off to the airfield, which has been all but destroyed by the Tomahawk missiles. They right. steal the F-14. Really nice detail that it's the F-14. Yeah. Really nice detail that it's the OG Top Gun yep. plane. It feels... Mm -hmm. Yeah. It feels good. It looks good. That is a 40-year-old piece of technology that still looks like the coolest goddamn thing on yeah. Earth. Yeah. How is that possible? Like, it just hasn't... A, and maybe this is just because I was, you know, eight years old when right. Top Gun came out. But yeah, it, it still, to me, just just sings. And awesome. we get these nice little character moments of, of Rooster complaining that it's old and Maverick, you know, caressing the control panel. And yeah. It's it's good, you yeah, know. There there are some there's, pleasant there's some moments, moments there. Yeah. yeah, they take off as you said, clipping the, the <laughs> silo and removing their front wheel so that we can crash onto the deck of the carrier. Which later. is awesome. All of that is so. They're cool too. intercepted by enemy fighters, and we get Maverick playing it cool. We're kind of echoing the first contact in the first original yeah. movie. Then they're dogfighting again, and Rooster tells Maverick not to think, just to do, mirroring the advice that he's been receiving all. This is just terrible storytelling. It's this is so just bad. terrible narrative. Yeah. You can't just have this character parrot the things that have been said to him without showing any kind of internal development or transformation at all. It just stinks. And the one person who is capable of doing rather than thinking is Pete Maverick Mitchell or yeah. Pete Mitchell Maverick, depending <laughs> on your choice. Rooster gets our one permissible PG-13 fuck, yep. <laughs> which is striking. Mm -hmm. They dogfight in the canyons. Maverick finally takes out the other jet. On the way back to the carrier, they're targeted by yet another enemy plane and they are out of resources except Hangman, yep. who comes into the rescue and it's great. Yep. It's it, it's inevitable. Len Powell gives exactly the levity that the scene exactly needs. Exactly right. He's perfect just cocky he's enough he's a star yeah. yeah but from the moment that he is assigned as the backup plane on the carrier yeah. you know exactly what is going to happen at yeah. the end of the film and it plays out with all of that casual predictability mm -hmm. they eventually land on the carrier despite the lack of that front wheel the crew celebrates mm -hmm. rooster and hangman shake hands you know we're just doing the beats from the end of the right, first film right. phoenix reminds everyone that they'll never be as cool as maverick <laughs> who even gets the nod of approval from john ham which is a brilliant yeah. moment they hug uh he and rooster hug uh thank you for saving my life it's what my dad would have done is the exchange that is written by a person who yeah. was paid to be a writer in that moment and then we're back at the bar Mm -hmm. Penny and Amelia are off on their sailing trip. We cut back to Maverick's hangar in the Mojave. I don't know why we do this. This weird false That's beach weird. here. Yeah. Where Penny's just not at, we could have So just we can get the Porsche there. in the desert? You know what? That's fine. So we can have Let's do it. this hot little 1973 Porsche. Hot. Can hot I have it? little car. Please. Because Maverick loves women with hot little sports cars. Why not? Extremely So good. do I. And that's it. Gaga starts singing and we get credits for all of the cast. We get yeah, like classic Hollywood. Which is Hollywood, cute and classic Half turn to fun. camera, give a finger yeah, gun. Like yeah. Really, Montages really good. Are forever. Yeah. And that is a wrap on Top Gun Maverick. Mm -hmm. And you leave the cinema despite this film's flaws, despite right. this film's, you know, if you want them to be dubious politics, you can certainly find dubious politics yep. within it. Despite, you know, everything that can be said about, about Top Gun as a phenomenon and God knows Tom Cruise is a movie star. I think you come out of the theater on a cloud i think we the, sure the, did the whole yeah. film is just incredible absolutely yeah we went out afterwards to uh the taco park and had a couple of beers and played a little bit of cornhole and just felt like <laughs> american citizens we felt so know, americans right that's true <laughs> It's kind of, uh, I, <laughs> I saluted a will. flag outside of a bank. It was completely I don't know what normal and good. <laughs> uh, say what you will. That's the thing is that it's really not about Americanism, and it's really not even about like individual heroism. Though that is, I think, the philosophical thrust of the film. Yes. That's not what it's about. What it's about is being a movie. It is like yeah, no, the it's proof a, of yeah. the thing within the structure and form of the thing. It's this totally. really formalist argument, and and on that level, 
it works maybe better than any movie I've ever seen. Agree. I yeah. just think it's I'm glad we saw Twisters in theaters because that was the next one that I was like, this one we have to watch. Sure. And I think it was the next one that we watched. In it's the entirely movie possible. Theater, right? We don't go to the movies. We don't go to the movies very, very much. Yeah. We don't. Yeah. And then the next will probably be F1. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> next I summer guess so. we've got F1 from Joseph Kaczynski and we've got uh, the next Mission Impossible. Yeah. I'm well, hoping I can start going to the movies more often because now that we went to Twisters again, I was like, no, this is just cool and it's fun. <laughs> well, and now that we have a nice new Regal now, cinema yeah, right here. Yeah, we've got a cinema that's close by. The new and, Regal has replaced yeah. the old shitty AMC that we yeah. have here in a strip mall on the north side of town. So it's, <laughs> it's nice to have some cool. better options for yeah. sure. We have a formality, my dear, yes. that we must observe here at the end of the longest podcast that we've recorded in a while. That doesn't surprise me. Let's Should put be. Top Gun Maverick on our list of every yeah. Tom Cruise movie ever and coming in We've got our very positive response to most of the film. We've got a yeah. very negative response to a few things about the film. Yes. And but we one have of those is like a major underlying your theme kind of, the of your bias against sequels, particularly yeah. vis-a-vis the iconicity argument. Let's take a look at our top five okay. and you can make a pitch on where you would like to put it. Okay. Right now, the top five is Jerry Maguire, Top Gun, Mission Impossible Fallout, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, and American Made mm-hmm. in the fifth slot. I mean... Let's do this first. Is there an argument that this film doesn't make it to the top five? I don't think that there is. Is it categorically better than Edge of Tomorrow, which is currently sitting at number six? Yeah, categorically better. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Categorically better than American Made. Okay. Um, It feels right to me to keep Jerry Maguire, Top Gun, Mission Impossible, whatever it is, a Mission Impossible in the top three. Okay. And then slip this into four. So I it think that goes this is better ahead of Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Yes. But you think it's not as good as Fallout. I'm interested that you don't think it's as good as Fallout because certainly I, talking to you about this film now for, you know, going a, on 2 you hours. No, I know, but it's not that. It's just feeling that the thing that we're making is the list of Tom Cruise movies like if you're having a person sit down and watch like these these are the ones. It just feels like if there's going to be two uh, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I don't know. Well, I... Let's just take Fallout as the point of comparison, okay. which we watched last week and, right. and thoroughly enjoyed. Yes. The, the Henry Cavill of it all, the Rebecca Ferguson of it all, the Michelle Monaghan of it Michelle all. Michelle Monaghan is really what nailed yep. it for me. Like, I, I just said, I almost always hate that awkward last fourth act, but that was my favorite part of Fallout. So, That's, I mean, that is the whole third act. It's just that the third act kind of, the third and the fourth third act. acts yeah. are intercut in yes, an interesting way. Yes, yeah. yes, you're right. In another version of that movie, we would have, you know, solved the problem with the nuclear devices and then chased yeah. Henry Cavill on a helicopter. And yeah, that would have been the fourth yeah, act. Yeah. But. It just had more heart, I think. The heart of this movie fell flat for me because okay. of Rooster. Yeah, I, I was can supposed see to care and I didn't. Though the rest of the ensemble... It is a little thin. It is a little mm. sketched. We probably do have three or four extraneous characters that totally. we could cut just to clarify, just to, I don't know, to center our attention mm. a little more. Is there any argument that this is superior to the first Top Gun? Is there anything? No, absolutely not. <laughs> just a flat no. Flat no. Is that the direction? Top Gun the is writing? almost a perfect movie. I, I mean, I agree. We were surprised yeah. to discover that as yeah. we returned to it. No, it's it's wonderful. It's, I yeah, absolutely not. And I'll tell you the other thing about Top Gun is that it's 109 minutes. It's 20 minutes shorter yeah, than Top Gun Maverick. Yeah. And that 20 minutes, I feel like, makes a huge difference. It's yeah. true. Do you feel good about that? Do you like it as the new number four? <laughs> uh, I mean, I agree with so much of what you're saying. I, I find it... I think I like Rogue Nation a little more than you do. You do. And that is my only, my only so hesitation. So you Fallout and then Rogue Nation and then Maverick. I, I might... I would, ah. I would really have to think about that, but I certainly don't feel strongly enough to disagree. And okay. I'm very happy for it. For the aesthetics alone, I like Top Gun Maverick splitting the two Mission Impossibles that we yeah. have there at the top of the list. Sure. And I'm feeling really confident about this top this five. Is the thing is, yeah, I feel confident about this top five. And I'm also secretly hoping that one of the next Mission Impossible movies will top Fallout. I, I hope so too. Yeah, that I, is just I mean, my hope. As I said last week, in much the same way as this is approaching the platonic ideal of what a Top Gun movie can be, yeah. except with one glaring flaw. Glaring. I, I really do, as I said last week, think that, that Fallout is getting real close to what a Mission Impossible movie yeah. can possibly be. Yeah. So I'm not sure if we change the format a little bit can we expand what it is can we can we refocus for those of you listening at home of course we have not yet seen dead reckoning i am watching it i think tomorrow to start work on my notes for next week's show which is very exciting because Mm -hmm. you know 
I genuinely love Mission Impossible, and I genuinely I love Hayley Atwell, yeah. and I think that there's a lot to look forward to, uh, including uh, uh, Tarzan Davis again. We'll be showing yeah, up that's right. in, in that cool. movie, so there's a lot to look ahead to. Yes, okay, let's pull the trigger. Let's put it in at number four or number three. Four. Pete Mitchell's a better character than Ethan Hunt. I'll say that flat yes. out. But yeah, I think Fallout just gets it on, on technical near perfection. Mm-hmm. It is it is closer to the mark. It is closer to the center of the bullseye than than Top Gun Maverick. So yeah, Top Gun Maverick in at number four on the list, <laughs> splitting the two Mission Impossible movies apart. Is that going to be our top five? I hope not, but it might be. We're going to have to wait maybe. and see yeah. how we feel about Dead Reckoning next week. Elizabeth, would you like to take us home? Would you like to return us to the carrier here with the list of our wonderful Patreon superstar supporters? Absolutely. Thank you to Leslie Skipa, Louise in Dallas, Megan Louder, Phoebe, Art Kilmer, Kimberly Bear, Self on a Shelf, Jolene Stark, Chris Dons, and the Lady Gordon. Thank you guys so much for your support. If we were putting together a really dubiously justified mission against uh, an enemy, <laughs> of some you kind. know we'd call you. <laughs> we right. train you better and we would worry about your survival. No John Hams are we. <laughs> God, sadly, in really any respect. <laughs> but that is our discussion of Top Gun Maverick. We'll be back next week with Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning with what is basically our last episode for now. Yeah. We're going to probably weird. do some kind of wrap-up episode in the weeks to come and then we will be back to talk about whatever the next Mission Impossible movie is, whatever his other films are. He's got several yeah, in the pipeline right now. Interesting so things happening. We're going to be back on The Last Star in Hollywood but for what will be for now the last episode, join us next <laughs> week as we discuss Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.